dear speakers, dear moderators, dear members of the expert panel, dear attendees. My name is Silvan Geyer. I'm the head of corporal medical marketing of Sigvaris Group. As such, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you in the name of Sigvaris Group to this first MOH, the Medical Online Hub webinar with the topic COVID-19 and thrombosis. The MOH is Sigvaris Group's commitment to facilitating and supporting the medical community. And we are already planning further relevant elements of this platform in the future. I would like to thank especially the speakers and expert panel members that agreed spontaneously to participate in this event and by doing so made it possible to set up this MOH webinar in such a short time. Thank you all for your interest in this MOH event. I wish you all a great MOH webinar with very interesting high class presentations and discussions. With this, I would like to hand over to Professor Giannizini for the introduction of the speakers and topics. Sergio, the scene is yours. Thank you all, uh, and uh, thank you also, Sigvaris, for this uh, very uh, outstanding initiative uh, that is uh, dealing with a topic that is of great interest, because thanks also to the contribution of the same Professor Caprini that we have the honor of having uh, with us today, we know that uh, thrombosis is a leading cause of preventable death. But uh, in particular, in these days, we know also that uh, related to COVID, uh, thrombosis is a leading interest uh, worldwide. So I think this uh, will bring interest uh, to all uh, the world around today. So you actually gave me a very difficult uh, task because uh, introducing Professor Caprini and all his uh, curriculum is like introducing the singing operas and uh, uh, all successes of Luciano Pavarotti. So I don't know where to start with that. Uh, and I will uh, simply suggest, uh, uh, I don't think there is somebody who doesn't know him, but uh, everybody can uh, see the outstanding uh, achievements of Professor Caprini. Many had the opportunity to meet him personally, and uh, the few ones who didn't have uh, to, to do that I really suggested to do that, because it's uh, really a human experience. And, uh, having somebody like uh, him steering us uh, over here today is uh, a very special occasion. So I will simply remember that um, Professor Caprini is, of course, from the University of Chicago, we know uh, his achievements inside the American Venus Forum and SBS, uh, and of course, uh, everybody knows uh, the score that brings his own name. I just uh, remind you uh, what uh, he taught us, uh, never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. That's coming from him and from a friend of his, a sentence that is reminding us the importance of knowing the risk factors, for which uh, we will all enjoy so much at this uh, moment. And uh, the wonderful, uh, humble attitude he has with all of us around the world whenever we are meeting him. You can be as big uh, as him, uh, but it's difficult to be uh, as uh, humble uh, and nice as he is. Thank you so much. So should we off go with uh, Professor Caprini? Uh, can you open yes. your mic, Professor Caprini? Yes. We can see your slides, but if you can uh, unmute oh, sorry. your mic, that's it. Brilliant. Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, uh, I, uh, I don't deserve that wonderful introduction by Sergio, but uh, uh, humbly accepted. I would say that uh, it's uh, a great honor, and I learn from all of you all the time. And uh, I can't say how how uh, thrilled I am to be part of this group and to interact with you. I'm sure we will learn a lot together today. Uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, now I've, I know everyone is shocked that I would start with the Caprini score, but let me tell you why. First of all, we know the importance of uh, thrombosis uh, risk factors to determine the incidence of venous thromboembolism in patients, but this disease is superimposed on everything we know. Uh, and so all of the, the, uh, the, the problems and the uh, risk factors and so forth that are present in patients, their baggage, as I call it, those unique things that make each person different, we add to that and compound it with the Caprini score. So let's talk about that for a minute. I believe very firmly 
that one of the still missing elements in the, of the COVID-19 pandemic analysis is not using individual risk assessment. Now, that's not to say that you need to use the Caprini score. There are many roads to Rome. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, we'll talk about that later. One of the beautiful things in medical patients is with Alex Parapolis's improved score. And he has very good data for that. It becomes even more important in this disease. But we use the Caprini score because it's so widely used in a lot of hospitals and because it's very difficult to, to teach a hospital more than one score. It's taken many years for my own hospital to start using the score. That having been said, we know it's a thorough history and physical. And as we said, you would never treat a stranger. So you have to find out as much about that stranger as you possibly can so that now they become like your friend. And of course, you would never hurt a friend. As the number of risk factors increases, the incidence of thrombosis goes up. As the power of each risk factor uh, is present, that predicts the relative rate or incidence of venous thrombosis. Putting those together and combining them statistically, we come up with a simple number that's been validated in 5 million patients around the world. And that shows that as the incidence goes up uh, of DVT, there's a nonlinear increase in the score. Now, capturing all four elements in the, in the score is a time-consuming experience. And one of the, uh, the negative things about this has been that uh, it, people say, we've got this emergency, we have this pandemic, how can we sit around and ask this patient all these questions? Well, the collection is facilitated by having the patient complete a preliminary patient-friendly form uh, in advance of elective surgery, and ideally with the help of family members. And patients that get sick, their families can help you fill this out. And uh, the physician and other healthcare providers responsible for the admitting history and physical can then review the initial document. And here we have, the document now is in a number of languages, at least this many that I've been able to find. And it's a simple, patient-friendly, validated score that we've tested out, and it works very, very well. And so, the other thing that people forget about is you can't score a patient. I had a recent case where the patient was scored on admission that was low, but the patient got a, a perforation, had to be reoperated, got a pneumonia, needed a central line, IV antibiotics. Nobody paid any attention to adding those up. So the patient remained on the chart as low risk. And you have to remember that this is a dynamic score and uh, often the updated score will result in a change of the thrombosis prophylaxis, including the post-discharge anticoagulant prophylaxis. Now, what's really important is the uh, completing this score, both initially. Now, why would you say that that's uh, uh, important? Well, if you take a, a person that has uh, uh, excessive weight, uh, congestive heart failure, history of thrombosis, past history of cancer, um, the uh, sleep apnea, uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, myopathy, uh, secondary to valvular abnormalities from hypertensive uh, changes uh, may be associated with the weight. Those, those, that means that that patient, when that patient gets the virus, that patient is automatically at very, very high risk. And in our opinion, that patient should automatically get at least double the prophylaxis you would ordinarily give the patient. Now, we assign the score of two additional points for uh, the diagnosis, another point if they're symptomatic, and then three more points if they uh, have a positive D-dimer. Then you have to add all of these risks of the, of the patient to the surgical procedure risks, and of course, update it during hospitalization. As I said, there's 500, five million patients where it's been validated. Now you can go through the, uh, on, on the internet and find about 20 publications that says it doesn't work. And that's usually because of three reasons. Number one, not collecting the data. Number two, not analyzing the data properly. Or number three, the, the concerns may be valid because there's certain operative procedures that may need to be scored much higher than the routine. And, uh, uh, but we also would like to point out that this really can be done. In Vietnam, they, they screened almost 300, 3 million patients over a two-year period and uh, did that very successfully. I want to talk a little bit about anesthesia because we forget about that. We know about Virchow's triad, venous stasis, uh, vascular injury, 
and uh, 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 hypercoagulability. So when the patient goes to sleep, there's venous stasis due to the calf muscle paralysis in order to intubate the patient. Venous overdistension can result, that can cause the, the uh, lining of the blood vessels to crack, and that is uh, exacerbated uh, by the patient's own hypercoagulability, whatever they bring to the table, and then the tissues are still metabolizing, and those metabolites are sitting in that, that soup in those dilated, uh, cracked leg veins, and the, uh, it increases over time. And that's why I emphasize to everyone, there's a, there's a trend today away from intermittent pneumatic compression. That's a terrible mistake. It's incredibly important in these patients. Here's a micrograph of the, of the dilated vein during an experiment in surgery in animals, and it shows the cracks in the endothelium as the vein expands and over distends and the blood clots form in these collagen parts. The other thing is white cells change into adhesion molecules. As the blood flow slows, that causes the change. Those adhesion molecules actually adhere to the endothelium and they penetrate the endothelium, damaging it. Other white cells turn into adhesion molecules and pile up on it. So this irreversibly damage, damages the capillary interchange, which is that, as you know, the interchange between oxygen and the nutrients. So, uh, one must remember not to look at the, the procedure alone. A minor procedure may be in somebody with a lot of baggage. You must use pneumatic compression devices to help minimize those changes. And always remember, you don't want to ever have a straight leg. It should be slightly bent because if it's straight, what happens is that it can uh, obstruct the popliteal vein, the popliteal entrapment syndrome in some patients, and that further aggravates these changes. And to emphasize again, the mechanical methods of prophylaxis are a crucial component of all hospitalized patients, mandatory during surgical procedures, and the, uh, enha there's enhanced uh, thrombosis prophylaxis when it's combined with low molecular weight heparin. And one of our, our, our panelists from Russia has done a wonderful job in, in discussing this and showing the importance of these combined modalities. The, uh, the off-quoted article from the New England Journal, unfortunately, has many uh, uh, pitfalls regarding combination therapy, and I would refer you to our, we've, we've written a rebuttal to that with uh, Stephen Kakos, uh, and more work needs to be done. We also need to start talking about home compression, because many of these patients go home uh, with problems, and they still require uh, prophylaxis. So what do we know so far? We can have these patients can present as mild flu-like symptoms, serious infection leading to death, pneumonia, respiratory failure, deep vein thrombosis in the arms or legs, pulmonary emboli, pulmonary thrombosis. I didn't write that on this slide. We now realize pulmonary thrombosis is an important com component. Arterial thrombosis and stroke and death. And the presence of additional risk factors compounds this. There were some um, uh, as we know, this started in Wuhan, China, and a coagulation test, the Tang article is a very often uh, quoted article, and the mortality was 11.5%, uh, uh, and coagulation tests were higher than testing the survivors on admission using D-dimer, uh, FDP, uh, fibrinogen levels, and PT and PTT. Now, uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation-like syndrome was seen in, in uh, when it was seen, uh, there was a very high incidence of death compared to those without it. And uh, the sepsis from the viral infection may lead to the activation of the tangled hemostatic web. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, they, the authors concluded that D-dimer and factor, uh, fiber and split product levels had a, uh, an importance. Now in COVID-19, the virus-induced inflammation triggers a cytokine storm causing tissue factor release, thrombin generation, fibrin formation to coat the virus and prevent the spread. What a clever mechanism of the body. Unfortunate side effect is thrombosis and the thrombosis can occur anywhere there's an endothelium. It's an attack on the endothelium throughout the body, particularly in the lungs. And that's a particularly sensitive picture here. And that's where it's very important because that's where the alveolar capillary interface occurs and all the oxygen and nutrients uh, and, and have to uh, uh, exchange there to keep the person alive and it's preferentially attacked. Now I'd like to talk about Ros Oscar Ratnoff, a famous hematologist 
who, who was, his father was a, a, a pediatrician and when he was born, he was very weak and little and the, and the doctor told the, his father to let him die, but he kept him warm with bottles. And later Oscar Ratnoff went, went ahead and became very, very famous. He was very instrumental in creating the clotting cascade uh, with Davies. He also in, uh, studied uh, and his patient, John Hageman and discovered factor 12 uh, inhibition. And I'd like to read a quote from him. I'm going to limit my attention to the emerging conception that the various defenses of the body against injury are intimately interwoven. As hematologists, we may focus upon localized thrombosis, as immunologists upon complement mediated cell damage and so on. The body seems unable to make such clear distinctions among its defense mechanisms. However, the distinctions are man-made and the devices through which we defend ourselves are overlapping and interlocked. As, as one, someone who has spent most of his life studying the way blood clots, perhaps I may be forgiven sharing with this process, starting with this process. Now, what he showed, and he actually quoted four experiments from the turn, before the turn of the 20th century that shows through the activation of the contact activating pathway, plasma coagulation factors 12 and 11, Platelet activation occurs, causing platelet plugs, coagulation, of course, with fibrin generation, fibrinolysis, of course, uh, to uh, negate the, the, uh, the thrombosis, but also inflammation, induced uh, uh, elaboration of interleukin-1 by human monocytes, bradykinin, the kinin system is activated, the complement system is activated. Up until this time, it wasn't really recognized the, the, the complement and calocrine systems could be activated unless there was an antigen antibody reaction. And this showed that factor 12 was very, very important. Uh, his theory of it was very, very important in this process. And here we see a very complicated slide that's just designed to show you the interrelationship of all of these things that are all going on at one time. And I know now we're focusing on thrombosis because that's a a big clinical symptom that we see in this disease, but it's, as you, as you realize now, much more than that. And uh, the, uh, I would just like to take a minute and talk about what we know about factor 12. Uh, and this is in uh, ARDS. It's life-threatening due to the onset of lung edema, hypoxemia, and loss of pulmonary compliance, and most importantly, impaired gas exchange. Sepsis triggers activation of the inflammatory response mediated through the tangled hemostatic web that starts with the, uh, the, the activation of factor 12 that triggers calocrine and complement and that causes increased vasodilatation, increased vascular permeability, protein leakage, lung edema, and vasodilatation that occurs that can result in ventilation perfusion mismatch. Factor 12 inhibition may offer a novel and promising uh, approach to antagonize some of these effects. But you know what that lung looks like in the ground glass appearance and the destruction of these elements between the, the, uh, the alveolar, at the alveolar uh, vascular interface. And here is a, a interesting study that shows that patients who don't survive the ARDS have a much higher level of circulating factor 12. And this is the cartoon that shows the, where these interactions occur and how incredibly important they are and what a target that is for this disease. Now, just as an aside, acuzumab is now being tested. It's a monoclonal immunoglobulin antibody that inhibits factor 11 from activating the clotting, clotting cascade. The drug has shown promising results as thromboprophylaxis in orthopedic surgery compared to low molecular weight heparin. And I just throw that out because that may be, we're going to need a very extensive cocktail to reverse the tangled hemostatic web. But this may be one component of the cocktail. And in patients who are prone to bleeding, although bleeding isn't a significant part of this disease, the pulmonary hemorrhages are occurring, and perhaps this might even be better than low molecular weight heparin, but that's another story. We'll, we'll talk about that because heparin has a lot of desirable effects against the tangled hemostatic web. Now, these were some re recommendations that were put out uh, using the, the, uh, for the, the virus. Uh, their international, regular, uh, rep, their international uh, guidelines and uh, again, recommending you've got, you really need to score your patients. Not one shoe fits all sizes. And 
the, uh, the use of low molecular weight heparin is very important. Mechanical compression devices are very important. And remembering that, and we know this now, that all of novel coronavirus patients should receive anticoagulant prophylaxis. We also need to protect the pregnant patients. And, and I'm, I'm surprised at the weakness of some of the guidelines that, that come that are referring to, uh, to evidence-based literature. This is a whole new ball game. We can't use evidence-based literature alone because remember, most of the clinical trials used to develop the guidelines, the CHESS guidelines, the ASH guidelines. They're based on average risk patients because you can't put high-risk patients into a control group. Here we're dealing with a gigantic number of high-risk patients. So we're going to have to improvise. We're going to have to collect data as we, as we go along. And also we remember that the condition of some patients changes rapidly and the risk of outbreak of VTE during treatment is common. It's a dynamic change all around. And I would say that if I found out that I got this virus, I might immediately, early and adequate anticoagulation, anti-inflammatory drugs, perhaps even steroids, a uh, variety of agents, the earlier and the more, uh, the earlier these are, the more effective. Now let's stop and look a minute here at the non-anticoagulant effects of heparin and, and related agents. Look at all these different effects. I don't have time to read them, but you have the slides. And anybody that wants this, of course, you just write, come to venusdisease.com. You can have anything that I have. I'm more than anxious to share it with everybody as we go along. And I'd now like to talk about what we put together uh, from the uh, American Venus Forum. And we, we did this uh, uh, and have published this as a, as a beginning guideline, and now this is, several, this is several weeks old, so things are changing, but at least this gets us started. All patients should receive heparin or low molecular weight heparin. We, uh, we need to use a risk assessment if you don't like that. You know, for example, I, uh, I want to point out the Padua score has been very, very successful. The improved plus D dimer score, incredibly successful. The British have come up with a beautiful score. That, that has actually, if it's properly used, can lower the incidence of death. We, of course, have the Caprini score. There's many roads to Rome. We picked this score because it's been used in a variety, uh, most of the hospitals uh, that we uh, are dealing with. But anyway, when you do the score, you need to, in our mind, if you double the, you need to double the dose for an increase in the score. Now, the, uh, the guidelines talk about increasing the uh, prophylaxis for a BMI of over 35, but what, what, they, what, what you have to understand is people who have BMIs of 35 or 40, what do they have? They have hypertensive-induced induced cardiomyopathy, they have valvular disorders, they have uh, 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 pulmonary insufficiency, they have uh, sleep apnea, they have diabetes with insulin. So it's a whole conundrum. And that's one of the things, of course, if, if you look at the Caprini score, we try to look at all of these things, but it's very important that these patients get a lot of prophylaxis early. And the other thing is that for whatever reason you don't use the score on admission, uh, my goodness, you've got to use it on dis discharge. And again, if you're, if, if you're used to using improved plus D dimer, Alex Peropoulos, that has the best data using uh, in the medical patients without the, the COVID-19 virus of a, uh, of a, a, a decrease by a third of significant VTE events after discharge uh, using either rivaroxaban or batrixaban. Now I'd like to stop and point out something that people never really talk about. And I would like to tell you how I look at immobility. It's uh, those who can't walk 30 feet at one time with both legs. And we know from the, the subset of the, of the Metanox trial, and that goes back to 1999, and uh, Al Amin published a beautiful sub a subset analysis of this study. And in medical patients without prophylaxis, their incidence was cut in half if they could walk 30 feet. So that's the definition we're using. Now, those that are using a cane or a woofer, that's fine. But if one foot isn't working, we know that if you don't weight bear on a leg, that there is no increase in blood flow in that leg. It's like having a paralyzed leg. And sitting up in a chair or walking short distance to the bathroom does not qualify as ambulation. And it really bothers me that in these very, that now that we're coming out with these extremely high quality ASH guidelines based on relative risk, uh, chance of incidence 
of DBT and they're very sophisticated in their analysis. But when they look at the charts, all, they, they only count uh, no ambulation as people who are at bed rest and that's nonsense. A lot of people that go to the bathroom or sit up in their chair are not ambulatory. So I had to get that off my chest. I'm sorry about that. And the same thing with casts, boots or braces that inhibit the normal calf and foot muscle pumps. Now we also decided that these patients with the COVID-19 need a serial blood test. And recently I saw a report that negates is that we don't want to follow serial D-dimers. That to me is not really valid because as those D-dimers go up, sometimes eight, 10, 12 times normal, you can't just sit there. You have to try to do something. And those patients, we, we try to approach with more anticoagulation. Uh, we have to remember about kidney injury and using unfractionated heparin. And unfractionated heparin, by the way, as an aside, has been my secret weapon for all the years I practiced and ran a coagulation laboratory. And thousands of times we would go to the operating room with the surgeons, although I was a surgeon, and have a heparin drip because this was a high risk patient. And if something happens and the patient starts to bleed, you shut the drip off. So it's a very important uh, modality that you can use. We don't like DOACs during hospitalization. We don't have enough information on those. Stick with the heparin or the low molecular weight heparin if you're concerned about bleeding and make sure that you're using mechanical prophylaxis. Now let's talk about ultrasounds. D-dimers, although they follow the severity of the disease and make uh, a marker of worse outcomes, ultrasound screening we believe is unnecessary if the D-dimer uh, is negative. High D-dimers should not be the sole indication for duplex scanning. Just because you don't have a clot in the, in the groin doesn't mean that they, the patients are, are not subject to pulmonary embolus. Uh, we know that 60% of people with pulmonary emboli have negative leg scans, plus the fact that pulmonary thrombosis occurs in this disease. So the venous duplex ultrasound should be used similar to what you would do in a non-COVID-19 patient and only if it's going to change the clinical care of the patient. Oftentimes those patients with real high D-dimers will be on full anticoagulation anyway. And the other thing is, I'm sorry about that, let me go back. Uh, if, if the patient, uh, if, the, if, the, uh, uh, if, if the patient does need a scan, you should use point of care ultrasound scanning with a portable device and hooked up to a phone or a little tablet and not drag those machines around the hospital that are very difficult to clean. Two-point ultrasound is very important here because you're just trying to find out gross information, but very selectively. And here's our algorithm for uh, inpatient pay, uh, with uh, COVID-19, BMI, Caprini score, and D-dimer. If the score is less than eight, the BMI is less than 35, and the D-dimer is less than three times normal. We use the standard uh, signs of, of a standard uh, low molecular weight heparin dose, which is probably 30 BID. It could be 40 once a day under certain circumstances. If the patient develops DVT signs and symptoms, then they can be screened if they have DVT therapeutic anticoagulation. If not, continue the prophylaxis. If on the other hand, their BMI is over 35, Caprini score of over eight, D-dimer, particularly if they have heart failure, they, they, uh, they should have double the anticoagulation dose at least. And if the D-dimer is three times normal or more, we're suggesting therapeutic anticoagulation. We're also suggesting uh, that what I've seen since is a lot of patients who are in ICU, they're intubated, they're prone, they, and they have a, a decreasing, uh, uh, increasing oxygen requirements and tachycardia. Those patients we put on low molecular weight heparin. Now, everybody should take a careful look at this slide. You know, the more we don't know history, the more we have to repeat it. My brilliant fellow, Alf, uh, uh, Juan Arcelis, who by the way, was very instrumental in making the Caprini score a reality, as were a number of other people that I'd like to acknowledge, but there's not time. 77% of people, and these are medical and surgical patients that were uh, discharged from the hospital in the Riete database, they developed a DVT and 55% of them after prophylaxis was discontinued. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you think is going on with COVID-19? It's, a, it's an, a, an increased layer on top of this. So these patients all should have a, a discharge prophylaxis and here's our algorithm for that. Patients with documented DVT, we continue the therapeutic anticoagulation. 
if the Caprini score is eight, the BMI of over 35, particularly if they have heart failure, particularly if they're not ambulatory, as our definition, D-dimer is less than three times normal, then they can go on a DOAC for six weeks or longer. And uh, if the D-dimer is three times normal, then therapeutic heparin with a follow-up ultrasound in several weeks, and anybody we put on therapeutic heparin to see whether or not they have a demonstrable DVT and then reassess at three months. I would like to remind you all, as, as much as I'm in love with the Caprini score, and I think it's the most thorough risk assessment, it's the, not the only road to Rome. And in particular, the wonderful data of Alex Spiropoulos and the Improve Plus D dimer has to be taken into consideration, and that may be a good starting point for a lot of these patients, but most of them are going to need prophylaxis. And so this slide just shows, of course, if you have all of these, the coronavirus is, is, is one ele powerful element in thrombosis. But look at all of the other baggage that surrounds that that the patient may bring to the table. And don't forget, there's an increased incidence of arterial thrombosis, DVT, PE, stroke, pulmonary thrombosis, primary pulmonary thrombosis, fatal pulmonary thrombotic events. Careful risk assessment is important. It should be doubled for high scores. Uh, or if you use the improved D-dimer score and prescribing discharge prophylaxis is critical. And remember, focused ultrasound. I'm sorry to rush through all of this, but I've got so much on my mind and I'm so anxious to share it with everybody that I apologize for rushing through like a fire hose out of control. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and please visit my website, venusdisease.com or my YouTube uh, site, Venus Resource Center. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Caprini. That was fantastic start to the webinar. Uh, I will try to take uh, some questions to you from attendee. Um, the first question come from Professor, from Dr. Vladimir Klashid Mendov. He said, according to Caprini, a score healthy patient with only COVID-19 diagnosis may, fail, may fall into a low risk category that would not warrant VTE prophylaxis. What do you say to that, Professor Caprini? Well, it's pretty hard if you, uh, if you already assign a patient of a risk score of two and they're over 40, that's three, um, th that although these, the, the, technically you may have some patients with lower scores, we recommend routine prophylaxis for all of those patients. And so in that, in that sense, you might say there's a weakness in the score. You know, this nobody ever said this was perfect. And yes. what we and the other thing is, so so here's another point for everybody to consider. And I often get uh, 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 run up against this, especially with the lawyers in, in wrongful death cases. And they will say, well, it's not in the guidelines. Well, let's say you have a patient, and uh, that patient has a uh, a a. a, a a fracture of the leg, guidelines say no prophylaxis. You don't give them prophylaxis, they die. Now you have another patient just like it. Are you going to do the same thing and say that's God's will? Or are you going to say, you know, that was a bad outcome. I'm going to use my clinical judgment and experience to try to improve the outcome. That's where we come in to answer this question. Although, yes, that's technically true. Clinical judgment and experience would dictate that we forego that because we know all of these patients are such a, at such high risk and that the disease escalates so rapidly that you need to get a start on this. And so anyway, that's the answer. Yes, it just came to my mind. Can you add to Caprini score KV positive or negative as risk? And then it will be like an updated score in the pandemic that we can use? Yes, yeah, so I, I've had that in the slides and I know I talk so fast and I apologize for that. But COVID diagnosis is good for two. We say if they're symptomatic, it's three. And, um, and then if they have a positive D-dimer, it's five. And you can see that most patients that get hospitalized, they have hospitalized because they have symptoms. And so they're gonna right away have a three. If they're over 40, they're gonna have a four. If they're over 60, they're gonna have a five. If they're over 75, they're gonna have a six. So that starts us right off. If the BMI is over 25, you add that. They have leg swelling, you add that. So very quickly, it adds up, so. Okay, fine. We got another question from Dr. Omar Dahlan. He said, thank you very much, Professor Caprini, for a nice presentation. Can family history 
of thrombosis increase caprini score in some way now you've hit another sensitive button <laughs> a number of years ago a decade ago almost there was very compelling data and a lot of it came out of scandinavia there was one study in 183,000 patients that were followed for 25 years there is an increase of venous thromboembolism in first, second, and third degree relatives. It goes down with each degree. That's number one. Number two, other studies in the American Journal of Medicine in 2009 have shown that patients that have a family history of thrombosis, but they don't have a thrombosis, but they have baggage, that they may be up to 60 times more likely than the person without that family history to get a clot. It's all out there. There, there's slides on my website that indicate that, but please track family history in those relatives and that automatically, that's a score of three. And if there's also a known thrombophilic defect, that's a score of uh, six. And for the life of me, as wonderful as these, as the Padua score is, as wonderful as the improved score is, uh, and I'm not sure about the British score, the family history of thrombosis, they talk about known thrombophilia. Well, that, we don't test for thrombophilia these days, uh, and that's relatively uncommon, but what's the history? And that's what I mean about never treating a stranger. If you don't know their family history, then they're a stranger, they're not your friend. Okay, now we have five of the uh, few hundred attendees raising their hand. I will take the first one, Professor Ahmed Din Hussein, he's Professor of Vascular Surgery in Shams University. He's well known for his quick questions. If uh, Professor Ahmed, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question to Professor Caprini. Professor Ahmed Hussein, can you open the mic? Yes, sir. Am I being heard? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, uh, Professor Caprini, it's a great pleasure uh, to see you live. Uh, it was one of my dreams, and uh, I tell you right away, you have uh, impacted uh, our practice in the region and in the country. Um, a great presentation. Uh, my question is, do we have enough current evidence uh, to go with increasing doses of anticoagulation in uh, uh, COVID-19 positive patients who are being hospitalized for severe symptoms, especially if they are uh, a Padua prediction score uh, four or more? Yes, yeah, so first of all, I'd just like to interject here. I had a wonderful, a wonderful time in Dubai, and I've had a wonderful time around the world. Of course. One of the penances that I have to pay for my sins is not being able to shake all of your hands and to hug all of you. Uh, oh, I miss that. <laughs> I, uh, I just, uh, the, uh, people, people are beautiful, and there's beautiful people everywhere in the world. And, especially in your region, I've had such wonderful experiences over the years. But yes, by all means, the more anticoagulation, the better. What's the downside? What's the downside? Uh, Leading risk. The, yeah, and, and, and here's the thing. So you're worried about increasing the dose? You can always use, if the patient's at high risk of bleeding, you use a heparin drip. If anything happens, turn off the drip. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I think more heparin rather than less early. And don't forget about Oscar Ratnoff, and at least you will knock down factor 12 as a partial pathway. You're not gonna control all the other things because of the cytokine storm, but you will knock down some of the contact activation of, uh, features which actually uh, superimpose themselves and, and make it worse. So remember okay. contact activation. That's, that's okay. That's we'll take another, take you. another you so question from attendee, uh, Dr. Juan. Chunga, please introduce yourself and ask your question. Joanne? It takes a few seconds for the mic to open. Okay. Joanne Chunga, I think probably from the name is from China. Yes, you're your mic should open soon. Okay, it seems we have a problem with the voice connection with Joanne. We'll take uh, uh, after that, Jay Seer, Sudka. Oh, Joanne, yes, there is a problem with the mic. We'll take the next, raise the hand. 
Uh, this three, good car, your mic is on, you can speak, introduce yourself and ask your question. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much, doctor, for sharing your uh, experience and the guidelines about uh, COVID-19 handling surgeries. I have a question. For how long should we defer the elective surgery in a COVID-positive patient? So I'm okay. sorry, what, what about the elective? He said how long, how, she said, how long we defer the elective procedure in COVID positive pandemic? How long do we defer electives? Well, uh, that's a, a, probably an impossible, very, very important question, but it depends on um, uh, how, if it's purely elective surgery, uh, I would really wait until things settle down. And that yeah. may be a period of months. Uh, especially if it's a quality of life improving procedure. Now, certain procedures are not, and even though they're elective, they may be done for very important reasons. So I, I think it, it varies according to the procedure. Uh, we, we certainly need to test everybody uh, prior to operating on them, and uh, uh, we hate to operate on somebody who is positive, especially if their P-dimer is elevated. Okay, we'll take the last question from Professor Erika Mendoza uh, from Germany one of the most eminent uh, vascular angiologists. Uh, welcome, Erika. Uh, your mic is on, and you can ask your question to Professor Caprini. Okay. Can I'm seeing Erika. I'm looking at the questions. She wants to know if scoring an anticoagulation at admission to hospital or yes. also I'm for with, ambulatory yes. patients. Yes. Yeah, the mic is on. She can, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yes. Thank you, Sorry. Joseph, uh, for this wonderful presentation. We, everybody enjoyed. Yes, I'm, of course, asking for ambulatory because you presented, I think, the data of when patient is admitted to hospital. But um, at least in Germany, lots of them are not in hospital if they have, uh, they are coughing and so on. And you know I'm trying to go ahead with a study to compare um, heparin in, in prophylactic dose. Do your guidelines also... Um, uh, at, are possible for ambulatory patients? This is the first question. And the second question you talked about for Naparinux, um, is for Naparinux also having this anti-inflammatory effect like low molecular weight? Thank you. Yeah, wonderful questions. And, uh, you know, I, I, I get heart sick for all of these countries when I hear you chime in. I've had many wonderful friends and times in Germany as well and many important contributions from the Germans. So first of all, uh, if a patient gets diagnosed with COVID-19, they should have also, this is an ambulatory patient now, so that presumably they've had some symptoms and because of the symptoms, they get a test. So that automatically puts them in, in, in my arbitrary score right now, that automatically they have a three and, and then all, but, but then also all the baggage. So let's say uh, the patient that if, if they're over 65, if they have other comorbidities, those ambulatory patients saddled now with symptomatic COVID that are, and they're still not in the hospital, I would start them on end prophylaxis right away. And there's a place, we don't have data in this, of course, and this has to be studied, but this would be a, a nice place. Now, if it were me, I'm so used to giving myself heparin shots and teaching them, I'd start low molecular weight heparin shots, but it would be very appropriate to use a, 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 a DOAC a direct oral anticoagulant for that, and um, uh, that would be possible. So don't forget about that ambulatory patient because uh, in the mix, who are the patients that get sick and die? They're the ones in the nursing homes. They're the oldest people with the comorbidities. The young people are walking around. A lot of them get it. Most of them, most all of them are going to survive unless they have comorbidities. Now, that's the other reason to do risk assessment because you may have, I have a, um, I take care of a family and the, the young man is paralyzed. He has locked-in syndrome, and he has a severe blood clot. But his mother, his sister, his brother, uh, and his grandmother all have clots, and he's 22 years old. So if you have a young person that has that, especially the family history in the background, that person is at very high risk. Now on to Fonda Paranox. We know that heparin by itself is a chain of, of, of around 50 sugars, and it's cut down to 15 or 20 uh, with uh, low molecular weight heparins of various uh, kinds, 
and that that removes a lot of the extraneous non-clotting uh, properties. But remember that Fonda Paranox is a very, very small molecule. And it's a wonderful drug. And yes, you can use it a lot, but you are going to lose a lot of the properties that you would get with heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Is that important? I have no idea. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, that was great. I will take final question from Professor Eberhard from Germany. Uh, you would like to ask your question to yes. Caprini? Yes, I do. I have a question on COVID negative patients or which might be on an elevated risk in home office or in reduced mobility. So my question is, do we know anything about the risk elevation in those patients which are victims of COVID, but they are not themselves positive with the infection? Should we not do also prophylactic measures with non-medical uh, prophylaxis, for instance, in those in home office uh, older patients who have other risk factors? Good, very good question. So let's uh, have a hypothetical. I have a wife who works in an essential industry, or maybe a nurse. So she comes down with COVID-19, uh, but is, uh, is, doesn't need hospitalization and is quarantined. So she's going to live with me coming back home. And now I'm the person and, and I happen to, uh, 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 I happen to be at risk. Well, of course, if it was somebody like me who's older, automatically I'd, I would start taking a, a low molecular weight heparin or a DOAC. But I think that the cases have to be individualized. The person that is living with the quarantined individual, in my opinion, needs to be scored. Score it with whatever score that you use, the British score, the Padua score, improve, and so forth. And if that patient comes up positive on the score, I would give them prophylactic uh, anticoagulation, especially with a with a DOAC and you know what's the downside and what's the downside if you don't do it and they get the infection and they happen to have had uh, let's say a family history and you didn't pay much attention to that now they can get the rip roaring disease and you may have been able to prevent that with a prophylactic dose science logic emotion and experience that's what we need to use for all of our patients in all of these situations so the mic is back to Professor Sergio to continue the conversation. Please, Sergio. Yeah, and I will take this chance of having all these experts uh, headed by Joey for a question that very probably has no answer. In few weeks from now, hopefully, we'll go back to elective procedures also on superficial venous system. And we know from the O'Donnell paper 2015 uh, that the risk of uh, thrombosis is uh, below 1% with the thermal, uh, with the sclerotherapy. But according to your experience in particular, Joe and all the panelists and all uh, the colleagues here today, do you think uh, having a more potentially positive asymptomatic among our patients, uh, we will have to consider one procedure rather than the other, for example, sclerotherapy rather than uh, endovenous thermal, rather than non-thermal for these patients? Do you think, Joe, it's going to make a difference, the kind of procedure we will do, or we should not care about this? Very complicated question. First of all, in, in those patients that uh, uh, you would test them if they're COVID positive, you wouldn't do it. That's number one. If they're COVID negative, then they would, I would give them a, a traditional risk score. And the other thing is that we know from Wakefield has got some very good data, uh, Andrea Obi and Wakefield in that group. And if you split the procedure, you use the lowest, in other words, don't combine, for example, endovenous ablation and also uh, powered phlebectomy or multiple phlebectomies, trying to do everything at one time. If you do individual procedures, the risk is less. But I would use the same, we have a score, uh, we use the score in those patients, but Wakefield has used the score. And if the score is over eight, then they, those patients need to get protection for a week. Now, that introduces an, another very sensitive point with me. We know over 30 years, that the efficacy for the anticoagulation to prevent venous thrombosis is five to seven and 10 days. And this idea to give a shot and that somehow protects the patient. In the United States, we know that's failed with the Surgical Care Improvement Project. One shot does nothing and several shots don't do anything. And the idea, and I'm still uh, I'm unsettled about the medical uh, guidelines that say, well, when you go home from the hospital, you can stop your anticoagulation. 
That's why that curve with uh, our cellist showed was so high. You need a week of prophylaxis. If you're in the hospital for one or two days, you need four or five more days of prophylaxis. And the same thing, if you're under eight, you don't need anything after a vein ablation procedure. But if you're eight or above, I would give somebody a week of prophylaxis. And then I would uh, 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 do a scan to make sure that there's no problem. And then if there isn't, stop the prophylaxis. Joe, can I just ask a, a little bit more? Would you, in this time of COVID, potentially asymptomatic positive patients uh, increase the duration of compression after a procedure, for example, or the anticoagulation prophylaxis in general, or not? Yeah, I've always had a bias with that. I had a lot of experience with pin, pin stripping, and I always made the patients wear compression for six weeks. And um, again, the downside, there's very little downside as long as the is the, is the, if the compression is properly, um, is, is, is properly sized and, uh, and, and is worn by the patient. You know, the British are done, and my dear friend Alan Davis and, and his colleagues, uh, they've done, and Professor Whitley's on this call as well. You know, this, this stocking conundrum and all this money we're spending on stockings, but the stockings aren't fit properly in most of the patients. And because they're not fit properly, they're worthless. And they may even be worse than worthless. Now in the United States, we use this, we use these so-called TED stockings. And the, you know the difference between a, a, a regular size TED and a large size TED is they're longer. They're no wider at the thigh, at the calf, in the foot, where it's very important. So my hat's off to what the British are doing, but until there's better sizing and so forth, you know, uh, you, without that, Again, that's another sore point of mine. Sorry to go rambling Thank on. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so Omar, should I go on or do you want to moderate some more? No, no, no. I think we took uh, most of the questions. So the mic is back to you uh, for the introduction of the next speaker and, uh, and that's it. So mic is back to you, Sergio. So I'm in troubles again, because after I introduced Luciano Pavarotti, I have to introduce uh, Maria Callas now, because uh, uh, of course, <laughs> Of course, uh, Jing, uh, Jing Song Wang uh, is very well known uh, with a curriculum that speaks for itself. She's a professor uh, in uh, China, in particular at the Sun Yat-sen University, and uh, she has been actually a pioneer also in the arterial world, where she has been uh, actually the first one uh, doing several uh, procedures in southern China. So once again, I will uh, suggest everybody to have a look at the curriculum of the spectacular faculty we have today, but even more to try to get in touch with them personally as soon as possible, because they have had the pleasure of also meeting personally many times uh, uh, Jin Song uh, that indeed uh, summed up his uh, curriculum when she sent it to me saying just say that we are close friends because it is indeed true and that's a pleasure to see that uh, big expertise goes also with big humanity and niceness so I hope soon we'll be in China on together once again uh, to enjoy the wonderful quality of science you have over there and also your nice attitude and with this I welcome your talk uh, Jin Song thank you so much While we are waiting for uh, the mic of Jing Song, she will be talking about the strategy for treating vascular emergencies during the COVID-19 pandemic in China. The mic is off, uh, Jing Song. You have to unmute your mic. So now... Yes, good. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Sergio. And it's a very honored to be uh, with the world famous vascular surgeons and the fellow biologists together tonight to share with the, um, the special situation of uh, caused by uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, COVID-19, we know it was broke out in December 2019 and it quickly um, resulted into the pandemic uh, uh, broke out in worldwide. And, uh, I'm so sorry for this, but this is the current situation and there are so many patients now. And um, during the pandemic, pandemic, because it's a strong contagious characteristics, frontline medical staff is at high risk for occup occupational exposure and infection. And therefore preventing nosocomial infection it's a particular important and challenging tax during this pandemic. Here's our data from China, like 
we can see at the beginning of the outbreak in China, and uh, there are many uh, physicians who were infected by the by COVID-19 because of the shortage of uh, PPE. And uh, during this pandemic of COVID virus, and vascular emergency cases such as acute aortic dissection, ruptured aneurysm, and acute arterial embolism, and DVT, uh, or other high mortality vascular disease, because we have a, a short rescue windows, so it is a very special situation for uh, of a challenging uh, to uh, like deal with, um, because nosocomial infections are most likely to occur from contact during the patient transport and the management for uh, this vascular emergencies. And uh, pro to prevent frontline medical staff members from being infected, our hospital, the first affiliated hospital, Sun Yasai University at Guangzhou, our vascular centers, has used the national diagnosis and treatment plan and the infection prevention and control protocols of our hospital in our operating center to, to dive to devise various protection and control strategies regarding the management of vascular emergencies during this pandemic. And given that the pandemic has spread worldwide and many international colleagues deal now with similar highly challenging and dangerous scenarios, uh, it's good like in some countries it has decreased. Uh, we are, I'm very uh, pleased to share our guidelines and the strategies for everyone's benefit. And the general principle, I think it's very important, like a, the hospital need to organize a very specialized medical task force group immediately after the infectious disease is announced. Here's the handbook of uh, our management and prevention of the CI, uh, COVID-19 from hospital. And we uh, translated it into English version and our um, eight team brought this to Sebio to help the people there. And uh, um, for the general principles, the first one is to establish prevention and control protocol in operating center. It's very critical for vascular centers because it can reinforce and ensure the protection by medical personnel. And uh, it also provides the protective strategies for patients pre and post operatively. And it gives the regulation of isolated operating rooms and uh, um, with rehearsal and uh, that can limit the, uh, uh, the cause infection in the hospitals. And during the pandemics, blood available availability for transfusion is often a very challenging situation because uh, few people give the donation and but the more patients need the blood, blood, blood transfusion. And the hospitals need to communicate closely with their local banks, blood banks, and keep track of blood available for planning operations. At the beginning of the pandemic in, in February, and our hospital only can got like uh, um, uh, 7,000 uh, 70, um, uh, 7, milliliter of blood per day. So it's uh, very limited for the patients need major operations. And the hospital should initiate as many blood donations as possible and to uh, get enough blood supply. And here's me to give our blood donation during the pandemic. And um, uh, for the outpatient strategies, to avoid cause infections and prevent the further spread of the epidemic, uh, elective and non urgent vascular operations like vascular uh, various close veins should be delayed based on the current and the predicted numbers of COVID-19 patients. Uh, elect patients should only be performed when the numbers of COVID-19 patients is low. And here's our cases, uh, our vascular uh, in the patients in our vascular centers. Like we can see, um, 
So th this blue is the uh, aortic iliac disease, and this red is the lower limb operations, and this green is the vis visceral and uh, aortic subclavian disease, and this purple is the DVT. And um, so we can see during the panic of uh, uh, during the pandemic of COVID-19 in February in the hospital, and uh, this um, the, the the numbers of the patients just decreased. But we are uh, our hospital because we have a very strict isolation policy, and so we recovered. Uh, you know, like in China, we recovered uh, more rapidly than, than other countries. Uh, for the spreading, uh, for for the uh, for the uh, for the reopening. So from uh, April and our uh, numbers of vascular disease just almost recovered as normal in as in the past. And uh, um, the screen and uh, um, COVID screening and the triage, coupled with vascular image studies, should be performed expert. Expert TH study. Screening for COVID, including um, history and physical examination with temperature check, chest CT scanning, and for, for regional uh, swab samples for nucleus uh, exit test and the point of care antibody test. Imaging relevant to the patient's vascular emergency should be completed. Nuclear exit requires an extended time, usually four to six hours, and, may, and, and it might can, uh, produce incorrect or unreadable results from improperly retrieved samples. Point of care antibody test for COVID-19 may be quick, but it's limited in locations. Uh, it is not popular in China. We use the nucleoside exit test more widely. Performing a plain chest CT reveals characteristics lung inflammation caused by COVID-19 infections. And this screen results can immediately differentiate COVID-19 patients from those with other conditions and, ex and expedite treatment planning. And uh, if surgical intervention is required, minimal invasive endovascular interventions are preferred due to less blood loss reduce the likelihood of blood infection, and decrease the post-operative recovery time. If open surgery is necessary, staged procedures and alternative methods can be used to avoid major surgical operations that involve the major blood loss. Life-threatening conditions should be addressed first, with secondary operations performed only after limits on personal protect equipment and blood bank volume have been lifted. And the type of anesthesia is basically determined by the type of emergency vascular cases. Aortic surgery should be performed and intubation, and the lower limb surgery can be performed and local nerve block or intubation is necessary. And the training is very important. Training medical personnel for COVID-19 related procedures and the rules are so important. Because, like uh, doctors, uh, most doctors have limited knowledge and experience in the prevention and control of infectious disease. The details such as wearing proper personal protection, enforcing disinfection measures, and engaging in proper training are so vital to avoid nosocomial uh, transmission. And uh, we are this is me to train our doctors for um, uh, with the knowledge of uh, COVID-19, and this is how they uh, to show like show how to do their hands uh, uh, sanitization, and uh, uh, our every faculties and staff in the how in our hospitals has been trained by the uh, different courses of uh, COVID-19 prevention uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, kind of control. And for the vascular emergency, the overall assessment and treatment principles including the two um, uh, situations. One is the treatment of com 
of confirmed or suspected COVID-19 patients with acute vascular surgical disease and patients with vascular emergencies with unstable vital signs caused by COVID-19 should be immediately separated as, and isolated. And a multiple, a multiple disciplinary team should quickly assess, assess these patients. And the level three protective standards, tracheal intubation is performed combined with other required resuscitation treatments. If possible, Vascular treatments is performed after the patient is in stable is in stable condition. Suspected or confirmed COVID nineteen patients with unstable vital signs caused by vascular emergencies should be resuscitated in an isolated area. Um, a multi disciplinary team performs a rapid assessment of the risk and the benefit ratio. If the benefit is greater than the risk, a surgical treatment plan is quickly formulated. The operation is performed in an isolated uh, DSA or hybrid operating room. After surgery, patients are transported to an isolation ward that actively treats COVID-19. If the risk is greater than the benefit, the patient should be isolated for conservative treatment following the same isolation procedures as above until his or her condition is stable enough for surgery. Patients who have unstable vital signs and cannot be a screen should be treated as if they were confirmed COVID-19 patients. Testing can be conducted later if the patient is stabilized. And treatment for non covid COVID-19 patients with acute vascular surgery disease should be treated for as usual following the process for diagnosing and treatment uh, and treating vascular emergencies. And during, during emergency vascular surgeries and our strategies uh, for the prevention and control of COVID-19 are listed as below. First is preparation of isolation room, operating room, it's, uh, an isolated operating room should be under negative pressure, <laughs> but if it is uh, not available and uh, an operating room with separated air conditioning can serve as an alternative. And uh, um, it, this should be limited the numbers of staffs in the operating room. And uh, um, Isolation signs marking the presence of possible harm for uh, staff should be displayed outside the operating room door. The PPE involved in the operation should be streamlined. The number of the, of the staff should be limited in the OR room. And uh, all the supplies are fully prepared before the patient enters the room. All medical personal um, equipment should all all medical personnel should be equipped with the PPE according to the level three protection standardized. And uh, um, for the patient transport, transport, it is very important. And uh, um, because the covent patient could cause the, um, the, the hospital infection during the transport. So special routes designed by the hospital task force is very important. And routes should be cleared and have minimal human traffic before transportation into limited contact. And the, um, more, uh, when for during the transport, and the medical personnel should wear the level three uh, P, uh, personal protect equipment. And the patients must wear a mask. And uh, if the condition is good, uh, the patient could be transported in an active pressure isolated chamber. And the um, equipment should be disinfected um, after each use with containing uh, with disinfectant containing 2,000 milligram per liter colorant or 75% ethyl. And the elevator should be immediately closed and disinfected with ultraviolet light for one hour. And the um, all of 
for the surgical protect for the surgical medical surgical personnel, they must put on surgical protect the wear and uh, uh, the intraoperative precautions should be alert very carefully. And uh, uh, this is our uh, three uh, uh, level three PPE equipment, and um, uh, with including the gown, the Google, and the um, uh, the shoe covers and. Uh, um, uh, to avoid, this is the, the best equipment to avoid uh, contamination from COVID-19. And uh, um, the, uh, during operation, the contamination of the environment should be uh, avoided uh, as, uh, as, uh, as possible. And uh, uh, if it's infected and the disinfectant solution with 5,000 to 10,000 milligram per liter coloring solution should be uh, used immediately. And for after operation and uh, the patients, um, if the patient is intubated during the operation, and then we usually send the patient back to the isolated ICU ward to extubate the at the isolated ICU ward. And then the surgeons and then the anesthesiologists and while while adhering the level three uh, protect protective equipment uh, during the uh, transport during the transport during the patient transport to the isolation the ICU ward, and the um, after the operations the uh, mm -hmm. surgical uh, persons should warn uh, should thoroughly um, uh, contaminated the. Uh, uh, equipment in the isolated area before entering a locker room and the personal should shower and change their clothes before leaving. And if they are su suspected to contaminate or um, they should go to uh, quarantine for uh, 14 days. And the fuller, uh, the reusable surgical instruments after the operation and uh, they should follow the, by the procedures of this disinfection, cleaning, or sterilization if possible and in the uh, colorant disinfectant. And for the pathological specimens and uh, pneum uh, pneumatic transport should be, shouldn't be used at any point in this time. And the specimen should be well labeled with uh, COVID-19 and transported from the negative pressure operating room along the design pathway to the pathological department. And for the wasteful items, they should be well packed in a double layer of yellow medical waste bags with well-labeled COVID-19. And the supply room is notified and uh, immediately before the items are transported there for their um, treatment based on the particles of this special waste for uh, bags. And the final uh, disinfection should be carried out. And uh, um, uh, when there are visible contaminants on the ground, walls, or other surface in the operating room, the, contamin the contaminants are removed entirely from such surface before disinfection, disinfected. And uh, when there are no visible uh, contaminants, the surface should still be wiped or rinsed with uh, 2,000 milligram per liter colorant content in disinfectant, and then um, uh, with clean um, uh, and then uh, with, uh, clean with water after 30 minutes. And the further um, indoor air and the negative pressure laminate flow, flows should be closed and, uh, pers and the, uh, the pra pra practical access fumigation disinfection, disinfectant should be performed. And the operating room post disinfection must be closed at least two hours before reopen. Negative pressure laminate flows be opened uh, for certain minutes before operations rooms are cleaned. And after cleaning, the um, negative pressure laminate flow should remain open for, uh, uh, for certain minutes. 
and after air is sterilized, in-room filters need to remove the and uh, uh, treat it according to the medical waste protocols to clean. And uh, um, uh, operating room can only be used after two sets of samples have resulted in a negative mark for contamination. And that, that's the um, uh, general strategies for uh, the, uh, the operating rooms during, during, before or after the operations. And besides of that, the provision of our personal protect equipment to patients and staff when needed is very critical. I think, I believe every country faced to the shortage of PPE due to it is a outbreak of or, or, or an infectious disease. And, uh, um, but I think the government or third part assistance to enhance PPE manufacturing is very vital to guaranteeing that a steady and a reasonable amount of PPE is consistently um, available. Like in uh, China, in our uh, uh, town, besides our country, um, uh, before the outbreak of uh, uh, COVID-19, there was only one single PPE manufacturing company. But in one month, and they built up to 20 factories to produce PPE. So um, I think the government and the third party assistance for to make the PPE is very important for the medical uh, persons and the patients. So in summary, and uh, um, during the pandemic of the um, uh, COVID-19 um, with for the vascular uh, uh, with the vascular emergencies, um, establishing detailed infection control and prevention protocols in all operating room is very important and expediting, expediting testing procedures and the patients for a screen for COVID-19 is very, is very vital. And you tend to think case specific, specific treatment planning for vascular patients with COVID-19 and favor the minimal invasive uh, methods and uh, um, establishing, establishing, establishing and reinforcing protective protective knowledge with the medical personnel and the training are very important to reduce the, um, the uh, nosocomial infection. And this is based on hospital medical surgical and protective protocols along with the related management process that developed based on our hospital experience. There are in in there are uh, in eventual def defenses and omissions uh, for the guidelines and uh, um, the quick the um, criticisms and the corrections and uh, suggest uh, suggestions are always uh, welcomed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jensing. That was fantastic. Uh, no wonder uh, China have such uh, very good numbers compared to other places. Uh, I really enjoyed your fascinating lecture and the elaboration of how we can going to start surgery in COVID-19 era. So let me divide. We're going to take one poll to take the opinion of the 1,000 surgeons. Here is the poll. If you are COVID, if you, your COVID-19 patient is admitted in ICU, would you apply graduated medical compression stocking? You have three options. Either yes, stocking is sufficient, or yes, but only in conjunction with pneumatic pump, or three, never, and use only anticoagulation. Please submit your reply, and it will take about 15 to 20 seconds to analyze the, uh, the result from the 1,000 attendees. After that, I will have a quick panel discussion, and then we'll take a few questions, and then we'll take another poll, and then we'll shift to Sergio after that. So uh, when you have the result, uh, Mr. Khalid, you can put it on the screen, and let me take the opportunity of such a great panelist with us, 
And let us speak first to Professor Eberhardt from Germany. What do you like to comment on Professor Jensen's lecture? Professor Eberhardt, your, your, your mic is on. Okay, I didn't see that, yes, okay. Uh, I, I think uh, this was a very good uh, lecture showing that it is necessary to be very careful with these kind of operations in, uh, in these times. And I think it's a very good strategy uh, to uh, minimize uh, the infection rates. And I think also that China has shown that it can be very successful. However, the conditions in different countries are quite uh, different. And uh, no, not in all countries, such a strict regime might be possible. Uh, but, uh, but it's uh, a good wish to do so. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you can see the result of the poll, which is quite interesting. 41% um, said yes, stocking is sufficient. Uh, and 46% said only in conjunction with pneumatic pump. And 13% said never. If I ask the same question to Professor Jen Sung, which vote you will poll on? Yeah, I, I choose the, uh, uh, the first one. <laughs> yes, I, I thought so. I thought the first one will be dominating, but it seems this information is not rapidly spread to other doctors. Let me take the opportunity, Professor Cabrini, do you like to comment on Professor Jen Sang lecture? If you can unmute your mic. Yes, thank you very much. That was an incredibly detailed and fantastic presentation showing just how careful one has to be, and also showing the results of what you can achieve with the proper procedures. And, and again, there's no, no, uh, no mystery why the, the cases are low there in China uh, with this kind of uh, uh, effort being put forward. And also I, I noticed it was very interesting that they went from one company to 20 companies within a yeah. month to, yeah. uh, to get, uh, that's, uh, that's incredible. So. Uh, yeah. I think it's a testimony to the, the whole system, and I congratulate her and and uh, all, I'd also at this point I'd like to say hello to all of my Chinese colleagues. Yes, we actually Thank were you. able to build the hospital 1,000 beds, I think in six days or something yeah, like that. Something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yes, let me take the opportunity of having uh, Professor Mark Whiteley, uh, your comment on Professor Jensen's lecture, what do you like to add? Thank you very much. I thought it was a lovely lecture, very, very detailed. Um, what I find very interesting, especially after the fantastic lecture before that with uh, Professor Caprini, is the interest I have really is what's the difference between um, the COVID infected patient who has a, uh, an aneurysm or something that's unrelated versus the patients that are COVID related vascular problems? It seems to me from what we've heard so far, this seems to be a distal thrombosis. So it seems to be more of a, rather than pulmonary emboli and vascular emboli going somewhere. It seems to be a diffuse thrombosis at the capillary level, venial level and arterial level. So therefore, this is almost different from the normal sort of vascular processes we see, which we have, you know, a, like a deep vein thrombosis that embolizes the lungs, or we have a thrombus in the heart that embolizes to a leg. This seems to be almost the end organ getting inflamed and thrombosing and then working its way back. Um, do you have a comment with the arterial cases you've seen? Do you think COVID is causing more arterial disease? And if so, is it a different pattern? Yes, Professor Jensen. So this is a question for me? Yes, it's a question for you, yes. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, like, uh, actually in our hospital, uh, there are very few COVID-19 patients. And uh, um, in, uh, I know, like, because our hospital, uh, you know, like the, the government uh, at the hospitals, uh, a lot of our uh, hospitals to send uh, uh, the team, uh, physician and the nurse team to Wuhan to help because there are so many patients there. And uh, their feedback is like, uh, um, I haven't heard like they have for, um, uh, like for, uh, uh, for our, uh, for our patients, uh, uh, 
like to be taken care by our team, there was no uh, patients with arterial embolism. But I heard from like uh, our, our uh, colleagues in the local hospital, like, like there, there was one arterial embolization for patients with uh, severe ischemia, uh, uh, like the patient underwent amputation finally. Um, so I would say like arterial embolism was not as popular as the vein um, uh, clot thrombosis in this patients, but it really happened. And uh, um, it, it, is, uh, uh, it is not very often and, uh, um, uh, and the outcome is very bad because like, you know, although like uh, um, this, the, during that pandemic, every procedure just de delayed because you need to screen the patient and the physician actually, I mean, the, uh, the, the physicians and the, um, the medical staff are uh, kind of scared with like this situation and they prepared very well. I mean, it takes longer time than the normal, uh, than the normal situations. And uh, um, uh, so I would say, it, and in our hospital actually, like because we are short of for the blood volume from the blood bank and the one patient with type A aortic dissection and he couldn't get operated because there was lack of blood volume and the patient died during the, uh, during the observation while waiting for the blood volume. So I would say like uh, arterial embolism is not as um, many as the vein thrombosis, but the prognosis is very was very bad during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, I can see a question from Professor Sergio. I know that you are very busy in the hostel, but uh, you can ask a question to Professor Jensing. Yes, it was just more like a brainstorming, Jin Sung. Wonderful lectures, of course. Uh, we restructured a little bit over here the management of ulcer patients. So since this is a phlebology community mainly, I was wondering if you can give us some insights uh, on how you eventually change the management of ulcer patients that are usually admitted uh, uh, for a daily basis in the hospital, and if you increase the, the self-management uh, of these patients at home, uh, how you perceive this in the future to be managed. So answer self-management topic. Okay. So you mean the vein ulcer, the, the patients who suffered from vein ulcer? Yes. Ulcer? Yeah, since uh, this is a Venus community, basically, of this, uh, this uh, webinar, I was wondering uh, if you can give us a perspective on how you change the management of these patients that usually come in the clinic uh, for, a for a weekly visit, and then now with the COVID around, uh, we will have very probably to uh, dilute in their visits. So that, for example, we significantly increased over here in Italy the self-management uh, using also products related to self-management uh, and uh, education of the patients in this. Yeah, I do, like um, I mean, like first of all, I will sh uh, uh, like share with you one case with a uh, a female, a, a female with a DVD, and the, it, this woman, this this lady actually, his, she's pretty young, is in in her in twenties, and she uh, complains with the swollen leg before the spring festival, I mean before the you know the big pandemic in China. And she went to the emergency room. She had the ultrasound screen, and but the patient. So she went back to for um, uh, she went back home uh, before the result, the ultrasound uh, uh, come out. Uh, I think, and then the patient, the, the 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 doctors in the emergency room didn't prescribe her any medication, and so she went back home. And she said, oh, it's so scared. I mean, it is so risky to go to the hospital during this pandemic. So she stayed at home for one, more than one month. And then after the situation was getting better, and she came back to, the, to my clinics. And um, so I sent her to the ultrasound, and I, sent, and, and, and I prescribed her a CT scanning for the lung. And because I suspected she must have blur PE because she didn't have been on administrated on any anticoagulation. And then the, 
one week later, her mom came to me and said, uh, show me the uh, result of the uh, pulmonary CT uh, A scanning and uh, she, she is got P and uh, um, she's with DVT. And so I want, just want to say that this, our patient is not as, I mean, uh, the, the, it's not, the value is not like your, the patients in your country. And during that time, the like, patients is more scared with COVID-19 than other things. And um, um, so I don't see many win ulcers during this pandemic. And the patients rather stay at home and to tolerate it because they think COVID-19 is more risky than the ulcers during this time. Um, <laughs> so I, but I mean, even, I mean, if they, if my regimen, I mean, to treat this ulcer during this time, I would just run them, them on stocking for, uh, to compression. And uh, because still during this time, when the our patients, when we um, uh, go to the hospital, uh, when we uh, admit the odd patients to the hospital, the patients still need to, to have their nucleus site exit test for COVID-19 and the plain CT scan. And both are negative, then they can go to the hospital, then, then, then they can be admitted to the hospital, which is very, um, I mean, trouble, too much for the patients with only vein ulcers. So uh, we are, we do not admit it to many vein patients as, um, as usual as before the outbreak of our pandemic. I think okay. they, yeah, thank you much. Uh, and Professor Ayman Fakhri, uh, I can see that you are uh, joining us from your hostel and you're very busy with your operating list. So uh, do you like to comment on Jin Song lecture? And we'll yeah. go back to Kathleen after that. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much. It was very nice and uh, illustrative uh, talk. Thank you. you. You did very well indeed. Uh, I like your strategy and uh, putting the priorities in order. This was great and showing the results of what you had uh, did in uh, your hostels, uh, it was great. Uh, let me ask you, um, what's the prophylaxis measures you uh, do for VTE prophylaxis? Okay. Uh, for, uh, for VTE, for yeah. in our hospital? Yes. And we use low molecular, uh, uh, low molecular heparin and uh, 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 river axven. These are the two most popular prophylaxis and the stocking in, in our hospital. Excellent. I can see question from Professor Caprini and then we'll go to Russia to Professor Kirill. Go ahead with your question, Professor Caprini. Thank you very much. I would like to comment on uh, Sergio's question because I identify with that with our wound clinic. We have a large number of wound patients and these patients usually are seen on a weekly basis and they get some debridement and uh, rewrapping and so forth. And <clears throat> one of the, the changes because of this is that we have taught patients and I also did this in the past is uh, to use a uh, Velcro compression device. And it's interesting because the sponsors of this, Sigveris, have what I think is the absolute best uh, uh, model because it has hooks and it doesn't have any Velcro, so it doesn't wear out. But even patients that are crippled can be taught to put this uh, Velcro uh, device on, any one of a number, there are six different companies. And uh, this is a short stretch compression bandage, which is much, much more efficient than stockings. And it's very much easier to put on. So that we have, I would say that in your COVID patients, and because of the COVID pandemic, all those patients are treating with ulcers. I would go ahead and uh, uh, try to teach them to use a, a, a Velcro compression devices of one sort or another. And then if they can't do that, uh, advanced wrapping techniques. And one of the, the masters in the world is Giovanni Mosti. Uh, and uh, we, you can learn, we, we can all learn from him uh, show you many techniques. And even if uh, the patients can be taught to use short stretch bandages, but they, the trouble with ulcers is that often stockings are used and stockings are not enough. 
because they don't provide short stretch compression. Excellent. That's a very nice point about an advantage of uh, one of the many products of Sigvara. So let me have the final comment from Russia, from Professor Carroll. Do you like to comment on Professor Jin Song lecture? If you can open your mic, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed the lecture. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the personal experience uh, in managing uh, surgical patients uh, during the COVID outbreak because uh, uh, all our hospitals are now just uh, carrying on COVID uh, patients, which is the infection hospital. But uh, what I learned uh, uh, during this month is that uh, uh, we should uh, take a, a a very uh, a big attention to the uh, protection of uh, medical staff uh, from this infection because in Russia uh, we now have the statistics that uh, we have uh, the highest number of uh, infection and even death in the medical staff who is uh, uh, providing the medical care to the patients, not only in the specific uh, hospitals uh, uh, designed for the COVID infection, but uh, also in uh, other hospitals. And some hospitals are trying to be a COVID free, but uh, we know that uh, this step may be felt negative in about about 30% of cases and uh, uh, any urgent uh, procedure uh, may uh, infect the medical staff. That's why uh, it is very important to use the uh, uh, personal uh, protection equipment and uh, all the other uh, measures uh, that uh, was uh, presented nicely in the presentation of uh, uh, Dr. Jin Song. Okay, thank you very much. So I will take three questions from attendees. There are three doctors who has raised their hand. Uh, and after that, we'll do a, a final uh, poll. So let me ask Mr. Dirk, um, your mic is open. You can introduce yourself to Ms. Mrs. Jin Song, and then you can ask your question. Dr. Dirk. Okay, if you can unmute your mic. We'll give it 10 more seconds to see if you're unable to unmute. Okay, sorry about that. We can take Dr. Anas Abbas. Dr. Anas Abbas, unmute your mic, introduce yourself and ask your question. I would just advise attendee to test their mic before joining the webinar uh, because some, some of the uh, problem with the mic communication. Dr. Anas Abbas. Okay. Again, unable to unmute. I'm sorry about that. We'll take, um, I think it's, his name is written in Russian. So uh, I cannot pronounce it correctly, but we'll open his mic. And I hope this time it works. We'll give it 15 seconds to ask his question. Question from Russia. Okay. Okay. Well, we're unable, so instead I will take from the question and the answer written comment. Uh, one of the questions to you, Professor Jin Song, in the mechanism of anticoagulation, is the mechanism of anticoagulation is clear? I mean, is it sepsis inducing coagulopathy or primary by chylokine? So he's asking about Dr. Fadi al Husseini is asking about the pathogenesis of thrombosis in COVID-19. Is it mainly inflammatory element or mainly endotheliitis? And what is the best way so we can trigger it correctly? Well, I think like Dr. Cabrina has uh, talked in his slides, I think it's because of inflammation. I mean, yes. I think it's very special inflammation. So I just, I mean, like, make, this COVID-19 is different from other variants like uh, regular influenza. It is caused more, like uh, more uh, severe inflammation compared with other variants. And oh. I heard from my colleague in Wuhan, like, uh, um, it's like uh, when uh, when the patient fell, feel like a uh, um, dyspnea, like short of breath, and it's lung has been. 50 more than 50 percent white and it means the inflammation is very severe so i think inflammation is the main mechanism from the thrombosis 
Okay. We'll take one question from Dr. Omar at Dahlan. He said, thank you very much for a great lecture. Do you recommend the screening of COVID-19 as a routine for emergency and the elective cases? So anyone going to hospital, do you do COVID screening? Or do you think this is a good policy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, in, our, in China, this is the policy. Uh, for every patient who go to the emergency room, I mean, for, uh, and if, if they want to admit it to the hospital, I mean, if they have an emergency, like a situation, they need to go to the, uh, go, they need to admit, be admitted to the hospital, every patient needs to have their screening test for nucleoside acid. And uh, that prevents noscomial infection. I mean, it, it is indeed and because like at the beginning and in one local hospital, they didn't test the screen the patient. There were two patients with COVID-19 who were invited to admitted to the hospital and the hospital was closed for two weeks. So I think okay. this is good. Excellent. I will take a question from Professor Isam Osman. He's one of the famous uh, vascular surgeons from United Kingdom working in Saudi Arabia. He's actually the advisor of the Minister of Health on COVID-19. Welcome, Isam. Uh, you can ask your question. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, uh, for a wonderful webinar. I, I have two questions, really. The first is uh, to uh, Dr. Jinsung. Thank you very much. I found your talk very, very informative and informs a lot of the discussions we're having here. Can I ask, when you return to elective activity, which I understand from your presentation, April, what um, were the conditions that had to prevail before you did that? Um, did you look at epidemiological factors? Did you look at bed occupancy in the hospital? Uh, and so on and so forth. And did you screen everybody? Were you screening staff before they were working in the area for elective surgery. So what, what was the mechanism for return to normal elective surgery? And, and before she answered that, Dr. Mohammed, I wanted to ask the panel in relevance to your, uh, your poll, have they read the recent publication of a very well conducted randomized controlled trial in the BMJ looking at graduated compression stockings as an adjuvant to pharmacothromboprophylaxis in elective surgery, which showed that stockings add no extra benefit to thromboprophylaxis. Maybe Mark Whiteley would like to comment on that in particular. Okay, so let us take the first part. Uh, what is the preparation we should do to start our elective work uh, in your advice, uh, Professor Jin Song? So you mean for the medical staff returning back to the hospital? Um, yes. Yeah, but, um, for the, um, we didn't screen the medical staff for returning the hospital. And uh, well, uh, we are. No, sorry, are, if I could. Sorry, Anne, that maybe I've not made myself clear. You stopped all elective vascular surgery for a period of time, and then you decided to restart again. So, what what were you looking for that said it's okay to to, to start again in terms of the surgery and the the hospital? If we're, we never stop the emergency uh, operation during the pandemic. Uh, however, like uh, um, it's like uh, uh, it depends on a pandemic. Like we uh, we take the uh, regular patients. I think as that's the early, uh, it's in China. We have very short time for I mean for um, for the uh, for the outbreak in especially in Guangzhou. Maybe in in, in two weeks. Like at the beginning of March, and we we like gradually open the clinics and admit the the patients. It depends on the uh, cases every day, like uh, um, uh, new cases every day in the city. Uh, I mean, it's different in China because we have very strict isolation policy. So it is quicker. I mean, than in non Western countries. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that's a good answer and good reply. And I know you have a debating point about the uh, <clears throat> last reading that we have done in BMJ. Uh, you know, there is multiple analysis to the effectiveness of graduated compression stocking, uh, especially in the era of post-COVID with thrombosis. And 
you will get um, in favor and against. I think most of the published uh, paper recommendation for graduate compression is talking that it will decrease the element of post-thrombotic complication. And also we know that the COVID-19 is mainly a thrombogenic disease. So I, I think the benefit outweighs the harm. So let me take the opportunity to have the final poll before we shift to Professor Sergio for the presentation of the last lecture. Now the second poll is COVID-19 endothelial illness involving systemic vascular tree. Do you believe that applying medical compression stocking can play a role in curing, reducing, or preventing a new serious dysfunction on COVID-19? Yes, always with anticoagulation, probably yes, and will help improve result, but not for curing. No, I don't think so. Please, if you can um, put your uh, result on the second poll, and then the result will show us in about 20 seconds. And let me in this 20 seconds take opinion of, of Mr. Professor Mark Whiteley about the uh, last published paper in PMJ about effectiveness of graduating impression stocking. Do you like to comment, uh, Whiteley? Uh, not really, no, on, on that. Uh, my, I think Sergio is far better, or, or Pro Professor Caprini, to talk about prophylaxis and stockings. Yeah. That's their areas. Okay, so we'll take Professor Caprini, then Professor Eberhard, and back to Sergio. Professor Caprini, your valuable comment. Well, thank you very much. We, we know again from history that patients that have a, uh, patients that have a low incidence of venous thrombosis, giving them anticoagulation doesn't further lower their risk of thrombosis. And the same thing, I think, with stockings. There's several things about stockings. Number one is that the stockings have to be sized properly, and we don't know from that study what was and wasn't sized properly. Number two, we don't know the risks of the patient. You put those on a low-risk patient, they're not going to do a thing. You put them on a very high-risk patient, they may help a little bit. And I agree with the overall evaluation that you said that in these patients that have many risk factors and have COVID and are symptomatic, the downside is, is zero as long as they're fitted properly. And I would always use them in conjunction with uh, intermittent pneumatic compression and anticoagulation. And so we need, we need more information. And I can understand why the article is written because they're spending millions of dollars of precious resources in the United Kingdom for stockings and they're putting them on everybody. And so, uh, you know, that's, that, uh, so that in that sense, the paper is very valuable because you can't just do that. But we need more information to find out what specific group might be a benefit. And again, I hate to come back to this all the time, but it's risk assessment, risk assessment, risk assessment. Thank excellent, you. Excellent, excellent comment. <laughs> and Professor Eberhard, eager to hear your comment. I want to make I want to make two points. The first point is on the nomenclature, because graduate compression stockings, that is what was used, but in reality it's 18 millimeter HG thromboprophylactic stockings which is completely different from medical compression stockings we use in ambulatory patients. This is something, you know, we cannot compare, we cannot put in one pot. So yes. that means thromboprophylaxis in outpatients is never done with thromboprophylactic stockings with 80 millimeters HG. So that, that's just one point for the nomenclature. The other point is that the incidence of deep venous thrombosis in both groups was very low, below 2%. So if you have such a low incidence of deep venous thrombosis in your population, both groups with low molecular heparin very effective, it's very hard to have any additional uh, benefit and you would need a much bigger study uh, in these percentages to see any significant difference between uh, compression and no compression. So much, it's yeah. a nice study, but I think it doesn't really answer uh, the question of the value of compression stockings in thromboprophylaxis. Yeah, thanks very much, Professor Everhard. And uh, the result, uh, you can see the uh, result of the second poll speak for itself. And the mic is back to you, Professor Sergio. 
Well, if I have to comment on the BMJ after Joe and after Everard, it's like singing after Pavarotti and Carrera, so, so it's pretty difficult as well. But I would say that uh, there is a nice publication showing, showing the importance of the interface of pressure. It was published on Journal of Biomechanics in 2013. And uh, you can have uh, even the same uh, surface pressure having 50% variation of the inner pressure. And there was another publication showing the variability of the interface pressure with uh, the different sizing. So if we don't start putting in the papers like we publish in a document uh, that we now publish on phlebology uh, after the winter meeting, uh, always the interface pressure, we don't know if we are talking about oranges or apples. So that's a fundamental thing to say, I would say. So thank you, Joe. And um, so if I, I have to move forward, I think, right, Umar? Are we moving to the third speaker? Yes? Yes, 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 yes. So this is just slightly easier than before because after having introduced Pavarotti and Maria Caldas, I have to introduce Andrea Bocelli. There is just a, a little bit uh, new, newer in the arena, but uh, still has a wonderful curriculum. He's a professor from uh, Russia, Pirogov University, and uh, he has also a PhD thesis uh, on uh, thromboembolism prevention. Uh, you will have the chance also in this case to see the wonderful job he's doing and I'm sure we will keep on seeing him more and more. But uh, more than that, uh, again, I would suggest always uh, to meet these uh, great professionals personally. I had the pleasure of being in Moscow with Kirilli and to explore what he called nicely a terra incognita, which uh, means uh, an unknown land, uh, which is the name of his meeting there. That is uh, really spectacular in the active involvement uh, from the stage directly to the operating room. So I'm sure we will enjoy greatly his uh, talk, and I see that indeed he's a smart one with the presentation already ready. So Kirill, uh, impress us, as I'm sure you will do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. I'm really appreciated for this invitation to take part in this uh, uh, brilliant meeting on the very important topic. And of course, uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, disconnected us and we have no opportunity to uh, meet uh, at any real conferences. But however, there is new uh, topics that we can discuss uh, uh, during such uh, uh, wonderful online meetings. And uh, uh, of course, this is my disclosure. And uh, you know that uh, 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 my country, Russia, uh, has has uh, taken, the, just recently has taken a, a second place uh, uh, of the prevalence of the coronavirus and uh, uh, now it's on the third place. But however, uh, we have not very high mortality rate. I'm not sure that it is uh, the proper statistics, but however, our mortality rate is about uh, 1%. I'm not sure what is uh, uh, the reason for uh, such good results, but however, uh, the statistic is so. And uh, of course, in Russia, we have some educational programs and one of them is uh, our program it's uh, called uh, the uh, School of Thrombosis and uh uh, Professor Eberhard Rabe uh, visited us uh, two years ago and uh, took a part in our uh, educational program. And uh, just a week ago, we had uh, also an online meeting and uh, uh, we discussed this problem. And uh, uh, when we prepared this meeting, we uh, reviewed some papers, uh, some uh, published data on this uh, problem. And now I would like to uh, present you the results of this review. Uh, it's uh, uh, focused on the uh, current guidelines that were published up to the uh, 22 of May. Uh, so uh, I would like to start with the incidence of uh, venothromboembolism uh, in the patients with uh, uh, COVID infection. And uh, uh, we found uh, 11 studies uh, with uh, one, uh, uh, just uh, a little bit more than uh, one and a half a thousand participants. And uh, most of these patients uh, in these studies use the low molecular heparin in prophylactic intermediate or therapeutic doses. And uh, as you can see, the incidence of um, uh, TVT in the general world was about uh, 13% and the pulmonary embolism about 8%. And in the intensive care unit, uh, it was rather high. The pulmonary uh, embolism occurred in about 80% of all uh, patients. Of course, uh, these uh, uh, figures are much higher than the previously published for the intensive care unit uh, patients and uh, the medically ill patients uh, in the absence of prophylaxis. But however, these figures are obtained uh, uh, at the background of prophylaxis with low molecular heparin. So uh, yes, we know for today that it is a, a very strong coagulopathy with the thrombotic uh, uh, surface with a thrombotic profile in these patients. And uh, uh, I would add some new information about, uh, uh, in addition to the lecture of Professor Caprini, who told that uh, this pulmonary embolism is not a rarely embolism, it's some kind of uh, uh, pulmonary artery thrombosis. And uh, this is uh, the summary of the uh, morphological studies in the diseased patients. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the uh, macroscopic thrombies that could be uh, interpreted uh, like uh, the real pulmonary embolism, it was found only in 10% of patients and 80% of patients had the evidence of the thrombosis of the small branches in the pulmonary artery and the capillaries. So uh, uh, it was called like the pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy. So uh, for today, it's uh, discussed as the main mechanism of uh, the uh, death of the uh, uh, deterioration, deterioration in these patients uh, with a severe coronavirus infection. Uh, and uh, of course, the reason for the anticoagulation in these patients are obvious. Uh, uh, on the one side, we want to correct this uh, coagulopathy, especially in the pulmonary artery and capillaries. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we need to, to do it to improve uh, the microcirculation to prevent the acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome. And of course, to prevent disseminated intravascular coagulation syndrome, which is the end of uh, uh, this uh, uh, septic inflammatory condition. And on the other hand, we need to uh, prevent uh, the uh, uh, thrombus uh, in the limbs, uh, the thrombus in the limbs to uh, avoid the pulmonary embolism that uh, can deteriorate uh, as well uh, the uh, respiratory status and uh, lead to the uh, hemodynamic collapse and um, uh, the uh, deterioration of uh, 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 gas exchange. And uh, of course, we should uh, take into account that uh, this uh, big number of patients suffering from the pulmonary artery thrombosis, uh, they need to be followed up to, and they need to be evaluated after three, six months after this uh, uh, event, because uh, we uh, actually do not know uh, the long-term consequences of uh, this uh, thrombosis. Will these patients develop the uh, chronic uh, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension or not? This is a very important question. Uh, so to uh, answer, uh, to um, now reveal the current status, the current guidelines, uh, uh, what uh, different uh, professional societies are recommended to uh, manage for the management of for this uh, coagulopathy. We uh, identified 11 guidelines uh, and uh, we uh, revised them according to the uh, different uh, points, uh, uh, the different issues. And you can see this, uh, the list of these uh, guidelines and uh, uh, the uh, search was li limited uh, by the English language. And I'm sorry for uh, some other guidelines uh, did not uh, 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 came in our uh, list, but uh, that uh, uh, that is all that uh, we were able to identify by the May of uh, 22. And uh, this is uh, the references on these uh, guidelines. Uh, so there were different questions about uh, uh, the uh, management of patients with coronavirus. And uh, the first question is the uh, risk of stratification for the venothromboembolism. And uh, six of 11 guidelines supported risk stratification and only one guideline didn't support it was the anticoagulation forum, and they stated that all patients who were admitted to the hospital should receive low molecular heparins uh, in prophylactic doses uh, uh, independently to their uh, individual risk. So there was uh, their, it was their position. And uh, the uh, risk assessment model that was mentioned in these uh, guidelines are Padua score, Caprini score, and improved score. So the Padua score is well known, and according to this score, uh, all the hospitalized patients uh, will uh, fulfill the criteria for the pharmacological prophylaxis because they uh, will have the acute infection and the reduced mobility. Uh, the prof Professor Caprini already presented uh, the Caprini score and the modified version of Caprini score, but it, we will take uh, into account just uh, the classical version of uh, uh, 2005. Uh, in this uh, situation, we can find the serious lung disease, which is the coronavirus infection. It is a score of one and the medical patient currently at the bed rest, it is the score of one. So two scores, it's uh, always as a patient will receive in, uh, if they will be hospitalized with uh, a coronavirus. And of course, uh, there's some kind of acquired thrombophilia, these uh, abnormalities that we can find in uh, patients uh, with the coronavirus and can be interpreted like as uh, the acquired thrombophilia. So according to this uh, risk assessment model, uh, also most of the patient will fulfill the criteria for the pharmacological prophylaxis. But uh, what about the improved score? In this situation, um, we can't find the uh, any uh, evidence for pharmacological prophylaxis for all um, admitted to the hospital patients because there is no any uh, 
references uh, to uh, the uh, acute uh, infection to the uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome only admission to the intensive care unit and uh, increased age uh, is uh, uh, valued for one point and uh, however there is a modification the improved score with the dimer and it takes in account also the increase of dimer and allow allows us uh, to uh, increase uh, the risk and uh, to provide the pharmacological prophylaxis. However, this risk assessment model looks not very good for the assessment uh, in patients who are admitted uh, uh, for treatment of coronavirus. And uh, there is one publication which um, test analyzes the risk of uh, venothromboembolism and uh, the bleeding risk uh, according to the Padua score and the proof score. As you can see, uh, not uh, many patients uh, fulfill the criteria, the high risk for VT had on 17% of patients and uh, high risk for bleeding only 7% of patients. But however, uh, all the VT events and all the bleeding events, uh, they were registered to only in patients at high risk of VT and uh, uh, high risk of bleeding. So uh, this uh, uh, risk assessment model, maybe it is not very sensitive, but uh, at least uh, this paper shows that it uh, should work in such kind of patient. Uh, so what about the prophylactic doses of anticoagulation, especially low molecular heparins? Uh, in uh, this uh, issue, all the guidelines uh, suggest that uh, a low molecular heparin should be administrated to all patients. Uh, it, could be, uh, uh, it could be given to all inpatients uh, or it could be given, given according to the VTE risk. At least the prophylactic uh, doses of uh, low molecular heparins uh, should be uh, uh, administrated to all uh, patients without increased risk. This is uh, the last uh, six guidelines, as they suggest, to uh, distinguish those of uh, low molecular low molecular weight heparin according to the individual VT risk. And the basis uh, for this um, uh, recommendation. It was published by the uh, International Society of uh, Thrombosis and Hemostasis. Uh, they were the first uh, who published these recommendations and they suggested uh, low molecular heparins uh, uh, to be administrated in all patients who do not have uh, contraindications and contraindications is just uh, the acute bleeding and low platelets less than uh, 25,000. That's the only contraindication. And uh, uh, the basis for this recommendation was uh, the paper from uh, China. Uh, they reviewed uh, the uh, about uh, 500 patients and uh, uh, about 100 received prophylactic uh, heparins and uh, there was no difference in the total mortality at uh, uh, 28 day uh, of observation but uh, there was a significant decrease of mortality in patients with sepsis induced coagulopathy and in patients with uh, a critically elevated dimer it was the dimer over then uh, six times over the upper threshold uh, and you can see that it was a uh, really very uh, intensive reduction of the risk in such kind of patient. That's why the uh, International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, they supported uh, uh, the uh, benefits of uh, prophylactic low molecular heparins in patients uh, uh, admitted to the hospital with uh, COVID uh, infection. And uh, this is uh, their recommendation. So they recommend just not to uh, monitor uh, the uh, coagulation status and uh, to uh, look uh, for the T-timer, prothrombin time, platelet count, and fibrinogen in uh, uh, hospitalized patients. But uh, also they suggest to look the same uh, laboratory. Uh, parameters in patients, in outpatients. And if uh, uh, they have uh, increase of the dimer or uh, prolonged prothrombin time or uh, decreased platelet uh, number or fibrinogen level, in this situation, uh, they suggest that to uh, identify such patients as a high risk of development of disseminated intravascular coagulation syndrome and even if they clinically not very severe, they uh, had not uh, uh, severe disease according to the uh, classical uh, classification, classical clinical classification, they recommend to admit such uh, patients to the hospital uh, because uh, they are at high risk of coagulopathy and uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Uh, what about the uh, increased doses of anticoagulation? This is uh, uh, the, ma the main issue and very important issue. And uh, I saw a lot of questions about it uh, uh, in our uh, web chat, in our question uh, section. And uh, uh, there is uh, a very uh, big inconsistency between the guidelines. Uh, as you can see, uh, about 50 to 50 percent, uh, half of guidelines recommend increasing of uh, doses uh, to intermediate ones, and uh, the other one. Uh, uh, 
do not support such an uh, increase and it could be performed only uh, inside the randomized clinical trials. So uh, five guidelines which uh, support such decision, uh, they uh, uh, suggest to increase the dose in patients with the individually high risk, for example, as uh, Professor Caprini showed, the recommendation of the American Venus Forum, patients with Caprini score of nine and more uh, could uh, receive the increased doses of the low molecular heparin. Uh, the patients who are admitted to the intensive care unit uh, due to the critical illness and the patients who um, have uh, the increased D-dimer level, uh, it may be increased uh, uh, not very high and it, were, it may be very high increase in the T-dimer level. And two guidelines uh, uh, do not mention at all the increased levels, uh, increased doses of the low molecular heparin. And what about the therapeutic doses of low molecular heparin? It is the most important question because uh, I know that in many countries and even in Russia, uh, there is a, a practice uh, to uh, increase the doses up to the therapeutic ones. And even in Russia, we have uh, mm, some strange approaches uh, to, uh, in especially in the intensive care unit to increase the doses over the therapeutic ones. So according to the monitoring of coagulation by uh, thromboelastography or by the fibrinogen level or something like this, so the patients are receiving uh, twice therapeutic dose, for example, they uh, increase twice. And uh, uh, what about this point of view? The uh, four guidelines support uh, therapeutic doses in patients without uh, uh, confirmed renal thromboembolism. And six guidelines uh, uh, suggest against uh, such uh, using of uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. Uh, those uh, which uh, uh, suggest uh, therapeutic doses, uh, they uh, uh, suggest to do it according to the D-dimer level. And uh, if a patient uh, has a suspected VT, you suspect VT in this patient, but you cannot confirm it. Uh, for example, if it is a, a patient on the mechanical ventilation and you can perform the uh, CTPA scan uh, for this reason. Uh, what are the uh, basis uh, for the increase of doses of low molecular heparin? Uh, uh, some of these uh, guidelines are based on uh, this meta-analysis uh, of the patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome, and uh, it showed uh, the improved uh, survival in uh, patients uh, uh, with uh, acute, uh, non-specific acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome uh, when they received the low, low molecular heparins. And uh, this was uh, more common and more significant uh, for the increased doses of low molecular heparin compared to the lower doses. You can see that there is a, a really a great uh, increase in survival <clears throat> about uh, <clears throat> Uh, 70 and 60%. And uh, there is another paper uh, from the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, uh, uh, which is usually referred uh, uh, when uh, the authors try to uh, uh, support the decision to increase the doses of, low, of uh, therapeutic uh, anticoagulation. Uh, so in this uh, 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 cohort. It was a small cohort of uh, 16 patients who had a uh, uh, very high hypercoagulation according to the uh, viscoelasticity uh, testing of the blood. And uh, uh, after trying to uh, improve their coagulation status by the increasing doses of low molecular heparins, by the uh, transfusion of the antithrombin-3 concentrates and uh, uh, adding the uh, clopidogrel. So there was a question about the uh, antiplatelet drugs uh, uh, to in the treatment of uh, uh, a uh, uh, severe form of COVID infection. And uh, uh, they had a good result. They uh, uh, were able to uh, reduce uh, this coagulopathy, but however, there was no any impact on the survival of this patient. Half of the patients died despite uh, the authors have achieved uh, good uh, coagulation status. So we cannot be sure that this increased, uh, these therapeutic doses of uh, low molecular heparins will impact on the survival in such patients. That is uh, the main uh, argument in the guidelines that uh, uh, do not uh, support the therapeutic doses. And uh, the, another recent study from the New York, from the Mount Sinai Hospital, which uh, showed uh, the uh, benefits of the therapeutic anticoagulation. You, uh, I suppose you know it, uh, uh, it was about uh, 3,000 of patients and uh, about 400 of them received the therapeutic anticoagulation. And uh, there was no any difference in mortality rate uh, among the uh, total population, but among uh, the patients on the mechanical ventilation, there was a great benefit and reduction of the risk uh, by 53%. Uh, and uh, here you can find the 
uh, survival curves uh, in the total population and in the patients on mechanical ventilation. And uh, uh, what about these studies? There is a very uh, clear uh, immortal time bias. Uh, so the anticoagulation was initiated uh, uh, with a median of two days and uh, intercortical range of, of from zero to five days. So that means that about 75% of all patients, they uh, received uh, anticoagulation uh, during the five days. So they should be alive during these five days. And uh, uh, the, in the control group, the patients who didn't receive uh, anticoagulation, they uh, died during this period. And you can see in this part of the uh, diagram uh, uh, the uh, great divergence between the uh, survival curves but however after the five days the curves are uh, parallel so that means that there was no effect of the anticoagulation uh, uh, that's why for today there is no any um, clear decision you know, should we uh, increase uh, the dose of anticoagulation in patients uh, uh, with a severe and critical form of coronavirus infection. And uh, uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, comments uh, uh, to uh, increase the doses, for example, this uh, uh, comment uh, to the interim guideline of uh, the uh, Society of Thrombosis and Chemostasis. And uh, the authors uh, suggest that uh, uh, such coagulopathy that we saw, that we can see in patients with uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, it's some kind of uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation with a thrombotic phenotype, and uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 disturbance of coagulation should be treated with increased doses of uh, heparins. Uh, also, uh, the uh, high levels of fibrinogen also could be observed in such kind of patients, and uh, we know that uh, high level of fibrinogen um, uh, uh, can lead to the uh, resistance to the heparins and uh, also resistance to the prophylactic doses of the heparins and then can uh, increase the risk of thrombosis. And uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, so high prevalence of uh, microcirculatory thrombosis in the patients uh, who died uh, because of uh, COVID infection, uh, it suggests that uh, the uh, microcirculatory thrombosis may be the leading reason for the uh, death. And uh, that's why even uh, there is a suggestion to use uh, the thrombolysis the TPA to uh, in critically ill patients who do not respond uh, uh, to the uh, adequate mechanical ventilation. Uh, but however, there is another point of view. It's uh, uh, interestingly that it is a paper from Italy uh, who uh, were fighting with the coronavirus for a long time with a very high prevalence and a very high mortality rate. And however, the doctors uh, uh, suggest again the increasing doses of low molecular rate heparin because uh, they think that it is a, a thrombotic microangiopathy and uh, the mechanisms of uh, uh, this uh, disease, uh, they are not the same as uh, the deep vein thrombosis and the pulmonary embolisms. That's why the standard doses, the standard prophylactic doses of the low molecular weight heparin, uh, they may be enough to prevent deep vein thrombosis. And of course, in combination with the elastic compression stockings, they may be enough to prevent deep vein thrombosis, but uh, to treat the uh, thrombotic microangiopathy in the pulmonary uh, vessels. Uh, they may be not uh, uh, sufficient. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, we know that uh, from the uh, autopsy studies, we know there is a, a very high uh, prevalence of hemorrhagic complication, like uh, hemorrhages inside the alveolus, the hemorrhages uh, uh, in the uh, interalveolar -al septa. So in this situation, uh, increasing doses of low molecular heparin, so heparin, uh, uh, it can lead uh, to the uh, deter deterioration of uh, this uh, hemorrhagic complication in the lungs. And of course, it uh, may, may not uh, be uh, it may not uh, increase the survival of such kind of patients. That's why this author suggests that uh, not increasing doses of heparins may be a need for these patients, but uh, we need to look to another drugs uh, as what the question to the antiplatelet drugs, uh, uh, to the drugs that affect the uh, Willebrand factor or the con uh, the complement uh, uh, and uh, some other uh, pathological mechanisms uh, that underlie the thrombotic microangiopathy, but not just increased uh, doses of uh, the heparins. So this is uh, the uh, general uh, consideration of the uh, guidelines, and you can see there is a high inconsistency in it, so there is uh, no uh, uh, 
opinion uh, to, to support or not to support the increased doses of low molecular heparins. And what about the mechanical prophylaxis? Uh, uh, in this point of view, five guidelines uh, support mechanical prophylaxis and uh, uh, six guidelines do not support mechanical prophylaxis uh, uh, at all. This is uh, uh, really unexpected uh, and I don't know how why it, uh, uh, so. Uh, Five guidelines supported uh, uh, mechanical prophylaxis if anticoagulation is contraindicated, and uh, two uh, supported uh, the additional mechanical prophylaxis like intermittent pneumatic compression in critically ill patients and immobilized patients. And of course, uh, this is unexpected because we know the reviews, uh, the meta analysis, uh, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, the previous meta analysis which. Uh, uh, does not take into account the new data from the uh, BMG that was published. But however, we know that uh, uh, elastic compression can uh, decrease the risk of uh, venous thromboembolism, deep vein thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism in hospitalized patients, uh, is in surgical patients and medical patients as well. So, so it is a, a very big data that supports the using of mechanic, uh, mechanical compression and elastic compression stocking in such kind of patients. And of course, we know the intermittent pneumatic compression, which uh, uh, can uh, reduce the risk uh, uh, of uh, DVT and PE, and it is more effective than uh, elastic compression alone, and uh, uh, it may be as effective as pharmacological prophylactic, uh, prophylaxis. Uh, that's why it's usually suggested uh, as an alternative to the pharmacological prophylaxis if the patient has a bleeding or uh, low th platelet level. In this situation, the uh, IPC device may be the only choice uh, uh, to prevent DVT and PE in such uh, uh, situations. And of course, the pharmacomechanical approach, when we combine the mechanical prophylaxis and uh, the pharmacological prophylaxis, it's, uh, it gives gives us additional benefits. It allows to reduce DVT and PE and uh, if we compare to the pharmacological prophylaxis alone, it uh, does not increase the risk of bleeding. And uh, uh, we have a study uh, of the combination of all these uh, methods uh, together, IPC device and anti-embolic stockings and low molecular weight heparin. It was done in uh, surgical patients to prevent the postoperative uh, DVT and PE. And uh, we included in the study uh, patients at a rarely increased risk. So they had 11 and more caprine scores. And uh, in this situation, this combination this uh, pharmacomechanical approach demonstrated the very good results and decreased the risk of uh, postoperative ET. Maybe this uh, approach, uh, according to the assessment of Caprini score and uh, taking into account uh, and uh, applying the uh, combined prophylaxis uh, in patients with 11 and more Caprini score may be uh, beneficial for these uh, COVID patients who are at uh, really extremely high risk for postoperative ET. But however, uh, there is no data uh, in such a in such a population of the patient. What about the extended prophylaxis? Uh, there was also some questions uh, on this issue and uh, uh, the uh, five uh, of 11 uh, guidelines, uh, they support the extended prophylaxis after discharge and uh, uh, two, uh, do not support uh, uh, this uh, uh, approach, but however, they do not recommend a routinely use of uh, extended prophylaxis, but they suggest that it could be uh, used in patients with individually high risk for BT and individually low risk of uh, bleeding. And uh, among those that support uh, this uh, prophylaxis, uh, one uh, suggests uh, extended prophylaxis in all discharged patients. It was the Italian Society of Hematologists. And uh, uh, the, four, uh, the four of them are support only in the individual high risk of VT and individual low risk of bleeding. So in general, uh, they recommend the duration of prophylaxis for 35, 40 days. So it was uh, uh, like in the studies, uh, Magellan Apex, which uh, evaluated the efficacy of the directoral anticoagulants in the medically ill patients. Uh, they suggest to use uh, low molecular heparin for example, lexaparin or rivaroxaban or bitrixaban. And uh, also they suggest that uh, uh, we should select the patients uh, who uh, are close to the inclusion criteria uh, for the relevant studies. I want to remember you that uh, in Megalan and EPIC study, one of the inclusion criteria was the increased D dimer. So uh, these uh, patients uh, with uh, COVID infection with increased D dimer, they usually fulfill the criteria, the inclusion criteria of the Megalan and EPIC study. So uh, they are very close to this population and uh, uh, we can suggest the benefits of this extended prophylaxis in patients uh, after discharge with rivaroxaban and bitrixaban. 
Uh, what about uh, the diagnosis of the venous thromboembolism? Uh, the two guidelines supported the liberal uh, diagnosis. So that means that uh, uh, if you do not see the clinical signs of uh, uh, the uh, DVT OP, but uh, there is a, a very high level of D dimer, or we can uh, see the uh, rapid increase of the D dimer during the follow up in this situation, we can make some medical imaging uh, to uh, confirm or exclude the venous thromboembolism. However, Four of 11 guidelines uh, do not recommend uh, the routine use of the D-dimer follow-up, and uh, one guideline have, uh, no clear, have no clear position on this uh, uh, issue. Uh, what about the clinical uh, uh, suspicion for the venous thromboembolism? Three guidelines uh, represent the uh, clinical criteria which uh, can be used uh, for uh, implementing uh, some additional testing uh, like uh, uh, CTPA in patients with uh, uh, severe coronavirus infection. Uh, uh, they are hypoxemia uh, disproportional to the known respiratory pathologies or acute unexplained right ventricular dysfunction or hematosis, uh, unexplained tachycardia uh, or uh, acute deterioration upon moving of the patient. So if uh, we see such uh, uh, symptoms in the patient, we should suggest the uh, pulmonary embolism and try to from the CTPA. But however, in the real clinical practice, it is not always possible to perform CTPA in such uh, severe patients. Uh, also, there are some uh, evidence uh, of the D-dimer, uh, the uh, predictability of the D-dimer to the uh, uh, Revealing of the deep vein thrombosis or uh, confirming deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism in uh, COVID patients. And uh, uh, there are two uh, uh, studies uh, from the China and one study uh, from the Europe. And uh, uh, all of them show that uh, uh, the threshold of about uh, uh, 1,000 uh, and uh, 500, uh, between 1,000 and 500 to uh, 2,000, uh, they have as a high sensitivity and specificity to uh, reveal the pulmonary embolism or a deep vein thrombosis in such kind of patients. So uh, this may be the additional marker that we can use uh, uh, to suspect uh, the VT. However, we should be careful because uh, we know that the uh, D-dimer thresholds in the Chinese population and the European population uh, are different. That's why uh, there may be some uh, inconsistency in this interpretation. And uh, uh, four of 11 guidelines suggest uh, the empiric therapeutic anticoagulation in patients with suspected VT. For example, if uh, uh, we see uh, the high level of D-dimer and we uh, suspect the pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis and we cannot uh, perform the uh, scanning, uh, we can uh, give to the patient therapeutic anticoagulation, not to treat uh, coronavirus infection, not to prevent uh, the uh, uh, venal thromboembolism, but uh, uh, to treat uh, the uh, suspected venal thromboembolism according to the laboratory finding. And uh, uh, this, uh, from, of uh, these uh, four guidelines, uh, three suggest the delayed imaging. So uh, after uh, you started the uh, therapeutic anticoagulation, you should make uh, some imaging tests to find out uh, if there is uh, uh, actually a deep pain thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. And one guideline suggests that if you decided uh, suspected pulmonary embolism in patient, you should give him therapeutic anticoagulation for three months without any uh, additional testing. So you, you made you you have already made your decision, and uh, uh, nothing should uh, uh, make you to change it. And uh, for example, this is a guidelines uh, from Netherlands, and uh, they suggest uh, uh, the liberal diagnostic of. Uh, uh, the uh, venal thromboembolism according to the D-dimer level. You can see that if it is higher than 1,000 or 2,000, you should uh, follow the D-dimer. And if it's uh, uh, rising up, uh, you may uh, uh, perform some imaging test or uh, prescribe to the patient the therapeutic anticoagulation. And uh, uh, it's more important that uh, if patient uh, has at the admission D-dimer of uh, 2,000 and more in this situation, you can uh, suspend the venal thromboembolism at the admission and try to uh, confirm it, or you may give to the patient the therapeutic anticoagulation without confirmation of this diagnosis. Uh, what about the switching of oral anticoagulants to parenteral anticoagulants? This is uh, also a very common issue in our guidelines, and most of them suggest switching of oral anticoagulants to the low molecular weight heparins, especially in patients who were hospitalized and uh, admitted to the intensive care unit. And uh, uh, if the patient is treated uh, at home, uh, in this situation, it is uh, uh, also 
uh, they also suggest to switch uh, uh, vitamin K antagonisms to the uh, direct oral anticoagulants if, if the patient is uh, eligible. And uh, this is the general considerations. So uh, in most cases, the vitamin K antagonists should be uh, switched to the direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, but however, there are some contraindications. You know, it's mechanical heart valves, it's valvular arterial fibrillation, it's antiphospholipid syndrome, it's serorenal uh, impairment and breastfeeding. And so you should take into account the drug-drug interaction. It is very important because some antiviral therapy uh, has uh, an interaction with the direct oral anticoagulants. And uh, if the patient who is uh, on chronic anticoagulation admitted to the hospital, especially in the intensive care unit, in this situation, you should uh, switch it to the low molecular heparin or even uh, unfractioned heparin uh, as intravenous continuous uh, uh, infusion. And uh, uh, the drug-drug interaction with um, uh, the uh, antiviral therapy you can find uh, from the, uh, this uh, website. It is a Liverpool drug-drug uh, interaction uh, study uh, group, and they uh, regularly update the data. As you can see, there is a uh, interaction between the uh, teratoral anticoagulants and uh, atazanavir and lopinavir and ritinavir, but there is no interaction with uh, remdesivir, so uh, it could be used uh, in parallel with the teratoral anticoagulants. And uh, at the end, uh, what about the outpatients? Uh, uh, Minority of the guidelines uh, pay any attention to the outpatients, to the prophylaxis uh, uh, of uh, uh, venal thromboembolism in patients who were not admitted to the hospital. And uh, uh, two of them support the risk assessment in these patients. Uh, and uh, for the risk assessment, uh, uh, they suggest to use individual risk factors, not uh, PADUA score, Caprini score, improved score, adjust uh, uh, individual factors like reduced mobility, increased body mass index, previous VTE events, cancer. And uh, two of them uh, suggest uh, the uh, pharmacological prophylaxis in patients who are at low risk of bleeding. And one guideline does not support pharmacological prophylaxis in outpatients. And I would like to stress your attention in this uh, issue that it is not the treatment of uh, the coronavirus infection. It is not the treatment of the um, a pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy. It's just the preventing of the node from bimbalism. It's uh, uh another issue, it's another indication to use the prophylactic anticoagulation because now, especially in Russia, we have a very big uh, uh, inconsistency in uh, the uh, prescription of different antithrombotic drugs uh, in outpatients who are treating for the coronavirus. We can find them uh, uh, direct oral anticoagulants, low molecular heparins, we can find dipyridamol, we can find uh, uh, sulodexide, a lot of drugs which uh, uh, tried, uh, doctors are tried to use uh, to improve the outcomes of the coronavirus. And for today, we have no any data that outpatients are at higher risk of VTE, and we do not uh, any data that uh, these anti-thrombotic uh, treatments can improve the outcomes in the outpatients. It is very important uh, to know. And I would like to conclude that uh, the prevalence of uh, VTE in patients admitted to the hospital with uh, uh, COVID is unexpectedly high. And the prophylactic anticoagulation, according to the all uh, revised guidelines, should be administrated uh, to all patients. What about the increased doses of low molecular heparin could be increased in obese patients, in patients with uh, individual, uh, individually uh, high risk? But uh, uh, therapeutic anticoagulation is not usually uh, supported by the current guidelines outside the randomized clinical uh, trials. Uh, uh, unexpectedly, the uh, mechanical prophylaxis is underestimated without objective reasons, and uh, uh, pharmacomechanical prophylaxis uh, uh, may be suggested uh, to all uh, ICU patients and individuals with the highest VTE risk, uh, for example, the Caprini score of 11 and more. And uh, the extended prophylaxis after discharge might be suggested for patients with increased risk of VTE and uh, low risk of bleeding. Uh, the D-dimer may be followed and used as a criteria for the diagnosis of uh, venal thromboembolism. And if you have the high suspicion for the presence of venal thromboembolism and you cannot uh, uh, perform the uh, appropriate verification of the diagnosis, some guidelines suggest to start therapeutic anticoagulation. And of course, uh, uh, for in hospital patients, uh, the heparin, low molecular heparin and unfraction heparin is preferred uh, during the treatment. But however, the standard duration of treatment uh, uh, in patients with verified VTE is three months. And after discharge, uh, most of the guidelines suggest that the switching of the heparins uh, to the direct oral anticoagulants, which are more 
more comfortable for such kind of, uh, of patients. And uh, what is important, we need to, to remember about the chronic uh, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and uh, to assess the patients three or six months after uh, uh, after the DIVT event uh, for this complication. And uh, if uh, we see uh, some uh, decreased tolerance uh, to physical activity or some dyspnea in this situation, uh, it is better to continue anticoagulation and to refer the patient to the specific center which is dealing with a, uh, a chronic post embolic uh, from uh, or thrombotic uh, uh, hypertension, pulmonary hypertension. And the primary VT prophylaxis is not uh, uh, suggested uh, in all patients, but uh, it may be a uh, benefit uh, for the patients, for the selected patients who, has, uh, who have the individual risk factors uh, for the VT. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would uh, uh, like uh, with great pleasure to discuss uh, this uh, issue if you have any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Kirill, for uh, such uh, excellent elaboration with a huge amount of information. And thank you very much. I'm delighted to have heard it. And let me take the panelist's opinion. Um, I can see uh, Professor Jin Song raise her hand. Do you like to add a comment? You need to unmute. Yeah, a very uh, detailed information of our uh, prophylax and the treatment of our uh, in and our patients with uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, um, uh, so um, I have a question like, uh, I mean, like, uh, um, so like in China, it is that the NOx, like a river oxygen, there's no evidence to, uh, to use to, to Proplex for uh, the patient with COVID-19. So what, what do you think? I mean, like, it's, why is low molecular heparin is the best one uh, currently? I mean, for some patients with 83 uh, enzyme deficiency, if they are, I mean, we do not screen them, but if the patient with 83 enzyme deficiency and the heparin, I mean, it doesn't work. So what, what, what do you think? Why normal cellular uh, heparin is the best, is the first choice for COVID, for patients with COVID-19? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I agree that, uh, and most of the guidelines uh, agree that uh, the heparins uh, are the best choice uh, for the uh, hospitalized patients, uh, because as uh, Professor Caprini previously said, uh, there is no, not only the anticoagulation activity, and uh, for today we have uh, a big speculation about the antiviral activity of the heparins that they uh, can uh, reduce the uh, application and migration of the virus uh, into the cells. It was uh, shown for the previous uh, SARS infection, but uh, it may be the same for the COVID infection. We don't know really for this. And uh, of course, uh, the um, heparins uh, uh, has, have uh, the antidote, so uh, they could be uh, controlled very well. And uh, if patient needs uh, some kind of thrombolysis or some kind of surgical intervention, you can uh, use it very uh, easily. Uh, just uh, use uh, a protamine sulfate, or if it is intravenous inf infusion, you just can't stop the intravenous infusion of unfractured heparin and uh, make an intervention. Uh, so uh, uh, according to all guidelines, heparins are preferable for the uh, inpatient patients. Uh, what about the dogs? Uh, uh, actually, in Russia, we have for also no indication for the using of dogs as primary uh, prophylaxis in uh, medically ill patients. So uh, these uh, drugs are indicated only after the orthopedic procedures. Uh, that's why for our country, that's also uh, off-label, but in the United States, the rivaroxaban and uh, uh, butyrexaban, uh, they indicated uh, for this extended prophylaxis after discharge in medically ill patients, and that's why uh, guidelines uh, uh, recommend to use it. But however, uh, in our country all, uh, as well, uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's uh, better to give to the patient oral drug after discharge and uh, make sure that he will uh, take it uh, than uh, prescribe him low molecular heparin injection and he will not use it. Okay, I can see Professor Caprini want to add a comment. If you can unmute Professor Caprini and let us hear uh, from your wisdom and your experience. Yeah, first of all, brilliant lecture by a brilliant young man that 
I recognized his brilliance about 15 minutes after I first met him a number of years ago. A fantastic lecture. And I'd just like to highlight three things. The first thing was he emphasized uh, the importance of using the mechanical methods in the highest risk patients. And I think that's really important. And the other thing that is important is that uh, he also uh, discussed, uh, and we need to remember this, it's not only increasing, or, or let's put it this way, just because you can't achieve a change in, in death rate perhaps from increasing the anticoagulant dose, more likely than not likely, you're going to improve outcomes of people that survive, number one. And number two is it's gotta be added to the other agents, the antiviral agents, uh, the anti-inflammatory agents, even corticosteroids and so forth. And so I think that was nicely pointed out. And then the, uh, the final thing is that after looking at all this and knowing what's in the medical literature and, and what has been published in the uh, improved scores, for example, why all the guidelines don't recommend outpatient prophylaxis? Because it's been shown in medical patients if they have increased risk to give them outpatient prophylaxis. So now we take patients that are not medical patients that automatically have an escalation of their risk because of the virus, how in the world would you not treat those patients after they go home? I, I, I don't understand that, but a lot of things I don't understand. Brilliant lecture. Excellent, excellent. Let me take the view from Professor Eberhardt from Germany. Do you like to have a comment or a question to Professor Krell? Yes, I, uh, congratulations for this lecture, uh, also for me. And I agree with uh, Joe that uh, it is not understandable that if you look to outpatients, that we reduce prophylaxis in outpatients compared to inpatients uh, or in-hospital patients. Uh, because uh, even the outpatients, and you have to look to, to, the, to the infection group, which has maybe a, a lot of additional risk factors. Many of those are of old age. Many of those have additional diseases. And it's, there is no, not, I can understand why we should not do any kind of prophylaxis, at least non-medical prophylaxis, mechanical prophylaxis we can do in those patients. But that is not uh, done. It's not recommended in the guidelines. So that is something I'm, I'm really not understanding. The reason may be that the groups which are caring for those patients are not very familiar with mechanical prophylaxis. And they don't, don't know so much about that, but they are more familiar with uh, drug treatment and drug prophylaxis. And uh, this may be a discussion also for the future. And as I mentioned before, even those patients which are not COVID positive, but stay at home, sitting at home for hours and hours uh, with a reduced mobility may have an increased risk for deep venous thrombosis, for instance, not for pulmonary uh, endothelial dysfunction, but for deep venous thrombosis. And this is also a group we have to care more uh, for prophylaxis uh, for deep venous thrombosis. Uh, it's not mentioned like in any of the guidelines. Dr. Krell? Oh, thank you very much, Professor Raba. I absolutely agree. Uh, the most guidelines uh, uh, were uh, prepared by the societies of uh, thrombosis by hematology. So these uh, uh, specialists who um, have uh, less experience in the mechanical prophylaxis, less experience in the using of elastic compression stockings. Uh, maybe this is the reason that uh, the, such a very simple approach is uh, um, uh, not uh, represented in most of them. And uh, for the uh, outpatients, uh, COVID negative or COVID positive who are isolated uh, uh, at home, uh, of course, of course, uh, I absolutely agree that uh, uh, the mechanical prophylaxis, the elastic compression may provide some benefits. Uh, not in the, uh, I, I just was, I just want uh, again to repeat and to stress attention. I do not believe that uh, such approach uh, can uh, improve the, uh, uh, outcomes uh, of uh, the infection uh, can uh, increase uh, the uh, chance to cure uh, the disease and uh, to uh, prevent the progression to more severe uh, 
uh, forms in the outpatients. But uh, I agree that uh, this uh, reducing mobility in such kind of patients is, is a risk factor for the venous thromboembolism and uh, the using of elastic compression stockings uh, in those uh, immobile patients can reduce the risk of venous thromboembolism. But uh, this is uh, not uh, uh, the uh, part of the COVID disease. It is a complication of the COVID disease. Okay, I'm Professor Whiteley. Do you like to add a comment or a question? Thank you very much. I have two questions really that are related. But the first is we've heard a lot, both last night and also today, we've heard a lot about the thrombotic effects of COVID. Do we have a clear number as to as a sort of percentage? How many people are dying because of thrombotic causes compared to any other causes such as sepsis or anything else? You know, is it, are we talking 20%, 50%, even 100%? I've seen some of the post-mortem data, but uh, you know, what, is our, what is our view now as to the, the importance of that? And then secondly, as it clearly is such a major factor and we can see the pattern of the thrombosis is not the same as we normally see in sick patients or patients who are having surgical procedures, should we be having a modified Caprini score or a modified Padua score for COVID? Thank you very much. Yes, please, Cyril. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Wheatley. Yeah, uh, uh, what about uh, the current numbers? Uh, they are unavailable because uh, the number of um, uh, autopsies, uh, they are low. And uh, for today, uh, we are, when we analyze the data, it's about only 100 autopsies uh, uh, that were published. In one, uh, uh, in one uh, 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 publication with a case of 12 uh, uh, died patients, uh, they found uh, the uh, big thrombus in the pulmonary artery and uh, interpreted it as the cause of the deaths uh, in uh, one third of the patients. So four of 12 patients died during the pulmonary embolism. But however, in other cases, they uh, not always uh, saw the big thrombus in the, in the uh, big branches, in the general branches of the pulmonary arteries, but about 80% of all patients, uh, in 80% in of all patients, they saw small thrombus. So if we are, uh, and uh, the reason of the death, of course, it is a respiratory insufficiency and cardiac insufficiency. So this microvascular, uh, microvascular thrombosis may be the reason of the death. So uh, we can suggest now that about 80% of the patient, at least 80% of the patient, they are dying because, uh, uh, or maybe in uh, uh, association with this microcirculatory thrombosis. And it is uh, really very important. Uh, and uh, now we do not know how to prevent it and how to uh, improve uh, uh, the results. And uh, please uh, repeat your second question. So as the pattern, therefore, is not the usual sort of embolization, but it's a pulmonary or end organ thrombosis, should we be looking with all the thousands and thousands of patient data we have now, should we be back calculating and having a COVID modification of these score systems? Yeah, I, I see yeah. Professor Caprini uh, has a comment on this. And uh, yeah. as far as I know uh, that um, uh, for today, uh, no, no of these uh, risk assessment model were verified uh, in patients uh, with uh, a COVID infection. And, uh, and now in our COVID hospitals, uh, we are working on the Caprini score and I hope in a few weeks, uh, uh, we will have uh, some uh, data on the verification of the traditional Caprini score 2005. And uh, uh, now uh, Professor Caprini show the modified version and of course uh, we will take it can, in account and uh, compare the classical version and the modified version and maybe we will have uh, some insight on this issue. Professor Caprini. Yeah, I think that's, a, that, that's a wonderful idea and uh, uh, again corona positive one point positive with symptoms two points or I mean corona positive two points if they're symptomatic, make it three, and if they have an elevated D-dimer, age-adjusted, age make it five. I'd love to see that, and I think that that needs to be done, uh, and, and it'll be very valuable information. We're trying to do it here, but uh, uh, the, uh, the Russian uh, studies so far have been so wonderful. You really know how to get it done and accumulate data, so I'm very much looking forward to what you find. Okay, let me take the opinion of Professor Ayman Fakhri. Uh, do you like to have a comment or a question to uh, Professor Krell? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Omar. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. But uh, I'd like to highlight uh, your point. 
it is uh, a case of disseminated coagulopathy, not pure venous uh, uh, disease. Uh, and I want to ask you, me and many other fellows all over the world uh, saw many cases of arterial thrombosis in COVID patients. Do you think it is a coincidence or the disease itself uh, has a different mechanism? Because if we agree uh, this is a different mechanism, it is not a pure venous uh, embolic disease, uh, we have to put other drugs, we have to put uh, uh, antiplatelets, we have to study it more. I want your comment, is it a pure venous uh, disease or it is another pathology? Professor Krill? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, there is uh, mm, very different uh, uh, theories on the pathogenesis of uh, this uh, COVID coagulopathy and uh, uh, one of the uh, most uh, appreciated it is the uh, thrombotic microangiopathy and also we know that uh, uh, the thrombotic microangiopathy it's uh, due to the uh, activation of platelets and so we know the role of uh, megakaryocytes in the lungs they ca can interact with the virus and the virus can uh, activate them and uh, promote the production of the uh, already activated platelets, already activated platelets, which can affect uh, as well as pulmonary artery and uh, peripheral arteries and uh, uh, anything else. But however, this is not uh, the only mechanism. There are a lot of other mechanisms, like uh, uh, Professor Carcrini told, uh, the thromboinflammation, the uh, endothelial uh, lesion. So we know that the virus can uh, move into the endothelium through the AC2 receptors and uh, uh, can produce the lesion of the endothelium. And uh, uh, recently, just a few days ago, Ago, there was a very nice publication in the New England Journal of Medicine with the morphological studies. They uh, evaluated the endothelium in the pulmonary artery with the uh, electron microscopy and find uh, the very intensive lesion of the endothelium with the uh, broken of its membrane and uh, a very intensive uh, proliferative uh, response with the angiogenesis. So it is very interesting. Uh, that's why this direct viral uh, invention into the endothelium, which uh, can be uh, found not not only in the lungs, not only in the pulmonary capillaries, but outside in kidneys, in heart, in liver, in uh, intestine, uh, in different organs, it's already uh, was uh, uh, reported. Uh, that's why, uh, and uh, uh, one more thing, it is uh, the antiphospholipid antibodies, which uh, uh, can occur in patients in about uh, 80, 90% of all critically ill uh, patients with uh, COVID infections, they have the antiphospholipid antibody. So all these mechanisms together with the uh, activated uh, platelets with antiphospholipid antibodies, uh, they uh, can produce the arterial thrombosis as well as venous thrombosis. So uh, my opinion that it is, uh, uh, reasonable to uh, use uh, some antiplatelet drugs uh, in such kind of patient, but of course it needs to be uh, studied. It needs to be studied. Uh, let me take a question from Professor Isam Osman. He is the uh, advisory to Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia on COVID-19 issue. Uh, welcome, Isam, on board. Uh, we will unmute your uh, question so you can speak. Uh, I think we lost the connection with Isam. I think we lost the connection. Okay, uh, thank you very much for a very nice discussion. Let me put the final poll uh, before we give the mic uh, to my dearest Professor Sergio. The poll number three, your COVID-19 patient is discharged from hospital. Would you keep the patient to medical compression stocking for VTE and PTS prophylaxis? If yes, for how long? No, don't need it at all. Yes, eight to 12 weeks yes more than 12 weeks if you can submit your answer uh, and let me take this few seconds opportunity to ask professor krell you mentioned in your guidelines that they are contradicting if the guidelines is relying on the same evidence proved the multi-randomized study why should they come to a different conclusion and if this so why you don't make a task let us say task four to unify the guideline all over the world. What do you think, uh, Krell? 
Uh, thank you very much. I think, yes, uh, there is a very big uh, need uh, to uh, make uh, some uh, compilation of these guidelines and to produce uh, something uh, general for the uh, whole uh, world. But uh, now what about the compression stocking cup to discharge? Uh, personally, I uh, do not know the studies that uh, assessed the anti-embolic stockings uh, after discharge and uh, their uh, influence on the incidence of uh, uh, post-operative uh, thromboembolism or uh, thromboembolism in uh, medically ill patients. But uh, uh, I believe that uh, if uh, the patient is uh, immobile after the discharge, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, elastic compression stockings uh, may uh, have some uh, benefits uh, and to reduce uh, the uh, venous thromboembolism. But uh, as uh, Professor Caprini told, uh, the uh, ambulation, the walking is uh, the most important issue. The patient uh, ambulated well and uh, uh, is working well. Uh, personally, I do not think that uh, uh, compression stockings can uh, influence uh, this uh, inflammation, this uh, endothelial dysfunction in the absence of chronic venous disease. If patient has absence uh, uh, chronic uh, disease, uh, uh, chronic venous disease, in this situation, of course, uh, he needs compression stockings and during this uh, immobilization, during this uh, isolation, the compression stockings uh, are very indicated to him. Uh, but uh, if there is no chronic venous disease and the patient is uh, mobile uh, in this situation, uh, I do not think that it provides some additional benefits. This is my okay. opinion and I don't know the evidence uh, for this. Yeah. We, we got the result of the third poll, and uh, as I can see, 72% of the 1,000 attendee from Facebook and Zoom platform, they mentioned they will give a token for 8 to 12 weeks, which is uh, fascinating. So uh, thank you very much, and the mic is back to you, Professor Sergio. Well, thank you so much, and I will take a few minutes uh, to make some uh, comments and questions. Uh, the first uh, question actually is Kirilli about the endothelial uh, aspect you were mentioning, and in particular the glycocalyx. There are like substances acting on the glycocalyx that we usually use in the venous ward that, that have been uh, demonstrated to be useful uh, both on the arterial side and also on the venous side, for example, surodexide. Do you think that in our venous uh, patients now, uh, we should start uh, thinking uh, about uh, these uh, uh, substances a little bit more, or do you think they could not play a role inside this new mechanism you are assisting at. Uh, thank you very much, Sergio. As uh, uh, for my opinion, uh, uh, this site may be uh, the best uh, drug uh, uh, in outpatients with non-severe uh, COVID infection uh, uh, because uh, uh, we know that hyperenoids uh, uh, have the anti-inflammatory activity and uh, they protect uh, from the uh, venothrombosis. And uh, uh, what is most important uh, particularly in Russia. Uh, we cannot, uh, uh, legally, we cannot uh, prescribe the direct oral anticoagulants because uh, they are not indicated for primary prophylaxis in medical ill patients. But we can prescribe sulbicide because it is indicated for the patients, for example, uh, in Russia, it uh, uh, seems like uh, uh, thrombopathy, thrombopathy. So uh, we can indicate it because the patient has thrombopathy, for example, it has the diabetes mellitus or arterial hypertension or some uh, atherosclerosis and uh, he's infected with COVID infection. And uh, in this situation, we have an opportunity uh, to legally uh, prescribe the sulodexide. It's a very important issue because only dipyridamol and sulodexide uh, could be used uh, uh, in this situation uh, on, uh, legally. Uh, that's why my opinion that it may be useful, but however, we do not have any trial we do not have any data that it could uh, uh, be uh, beneficial to prevention of venous thromboembolism or it could be beneficial to uh, uh, reducing the risk of uh, the deterioration of uh, this uh, disease. Uh, this is my opinion. And this is a question uh, for all the three uh, experts we have uh, today with us as speakers. Uh, are you aware of uh, data crossover in terms of thromboembolism and different races looking also at the tendency of the different races to have a thrombosis. I don't know if this is something that could be uh, useful to look at in the near future to understand better that the pathophysiology of COVID-19. What do you think uh, about uh, different races uh, uh, impact of COVID and related thrombosis? Did you get the question? Should I? Oh, you asked me? Yeah, it is oh, for, okay. you, for you, for you, Stonga and Joe. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what about the uh, uh, race uh, uh, difference? Uh, of course, we know that uh, in Chinese population, the uh, risk for uh, venothromboembolism is low because they have uh, the lower uh, prevalence of uh, the thrombophilia. Uh, that's why. But however, when we see the uh, numbers, uh, the figures uh, from the papers uh, that are coming from China, we have uh, uh, very high. So they found, for example, at 25% of uh, deep vein thrombosis in the intensive care unit. So it's uh, uh, absolutely higher than uh, the previous uh, data that uh, was associated not with COVID infection, but for example, for, with other patients uh, from intensive care unit, it was uh, uh, twice lower, about uh, 12%, 15%. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, Genetics uh, play uh, plays a role and uh, make some impact on the uh, incidence of uh, uh, complication and incidence of venothromboembolism. But however, uh, the relative value, uh, the relative increase, I suggest that it is similar. So in European population, we have the high level of venothromboembolism. So we will have the higher absolute uh, numbers, but the uh, value of increase of relative risk, I suppose, will be the same like in the Chinese population. Joe, do you agree with this? I was curious on your opinion. Yes, I think that there are more similarities than differences. And, and uh, without repeating everything that Curl said, I think that, uh, that the other thing is that the individual factors are different. You have the genetics, you have the lifestyles, you have people that, uh, that are based on their diets. Uh, so there are various things, but in general, there are more similarities than differences. But it is important to take these things into consideration. So in answer to your question, the single most important thing to do is to continue to assess risk, both with the current risk assessment models and improving those models and improving risk assessment. You know, as I've been around the world, the more people are pretty similar, really. Uh, there's more similarities than there are differences. Just they talk different, they have different <laughs> cultures, and that type of thing, but they're pretty much the same. Jin Sung, do you have a comment? Yeah, I agree with the, uh, both of them. But I want to just add one uh, point. Is like, I mean, we should like control, the, uh, I mean, reduce the severity uh, cases of current uh, uh, patients. Uh, I think if the patient developed into the severity uh, uh, phase of the, 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 the COVID infection, and there's, I mean, the incidence of thrombosis is similar between among the uh, races. I think one of the um, most successful factor in China is like, um, like we, like we, 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 we cut off the, I mean, the, 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 the transmission pathway. So, and we give the oxygen supply earlier, as early as possible. So our, um, a lower number of patients developed into severe phase compared with the Western countries. Uh, like we, you know, like we send a lot of medical staffs to Wuhan and we expect that like they would come back in July or June, but they came back earlier at the end of April. And I think the most important thing is like we are collect the patients, I mean, or uh, potential infected patients in our, in, you know, in, in our, in, in, in the big, in our, uh, in our, uh, like we call it, it's a Fang Chang hospital. And so we can observe which patients could develop into severity. And then we transfer it into our hospital with more uh, better supplies to treat them earlier. And uh, I think like our frontline uh, medical staff that early oxygen supply is very important. That can reduce, I mean, the possibility of the, pa the, the, the patients get developed into the severity uh, phase. I, I do believe like this thrombolysis occurred more frankly in the patients uh, with severity phase. I mean, if we can control that lower the number of the severity uh, patients, we can reduce the VTE incidence in current patients. 
Thank, thank you so much. So since I see that the time is almost over, we will um, drag the, some conclusion. I think it was really interesting, Omar, what you said about uh, the guidelines. As you know, we have been working quite hard together with many colleagues and friends who are here. I'm mute. No, okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, that um, have been involved with us uh, um, with the Wien Foundation last uh, January with the Winter document, talking about, can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? I can hear you. Yes. 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 And uh, we indeed yes. pointed out uh, the data uh, regarding similarities and controversies uh, in uh, global guidelines. So it is absolutely a need of uh, a common effort uh, in uh, delivering uh, homogeneous uh, data. Yes. In uh, this, uh, I want to say that there is a nice paper yeah. uh, back 2002 talking about intermittent chromatic compression that you were mentioning, uh, Kirill, that was showing actually how just uh, one patient out of five in the ICU was uh, enjoying a properly used uh, IPC, meaning that they had the IPC on, but it was uh, not uh, put on properly. Like Joe was saying, for example, the importance of the sizing of compression. So these data are tendentially biased. So I think it's fundamental that we yeah. gather together for proper homogeneous data at the same time having global guidelines of the difficulty of the different nation uh, aspects for which we have always, of course, to combine appendixes uh, fitting in the different yeah. nations. Gathering together, I would also like to take this chance uh, to deeply thank all the colleagues who are here involved uh, today with this uh, webinar and also all the ones who will be involved with us starting from next Saturday in uh, what is uh, a common effort uh, of a not-for-profit initiatives we are developing uh, always with the Women Foundation because Lancet Journal published uh, recently the impact of COVID, not just on the clinical aspect as we have seen now, but also on uh, the health aspect of the general population because of the starvation following uh, the lockdown policies, uh, particularly in the poorest population. So I'd like to take this chance to once again uh, uh, deeply thank all of the attendees of this you know, wonderful initiative of today to deeply thank Sigvaris that I appreciate uh, in uh, choosing uh, a topic uh, that is uh, not, it is actually directly related to compression, but not stressing out so much of the topic of compression, because I think that indeed their learning is supported in a 360 degree way. So I really appreciate uh, the top quality level of uh, these uh, webinars. No need to say the honor and pleasure of having friends and uh, huge colleagues like uh, Joe Jin Song and Kiridi speaking. And of course, the pleasure of sharing uh, this webinar with, uh, I would say, the best host in the world because uh, you are like really well trained as host of webinars now, Omar. So it's really a pleasure of uh, being here with really? you. So I would say thanks again, everybody. I think the take home message is that we have to collect the homogeneous data and uh, stay uh, pretty ready in uh, changing uh, our indications since we are in a changing world, unfortunately, in these days, hopefully, in a better change future. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.